Villain Evil Mentor Program. Big Villain Evil Mentor Program. Hello, everybody. I am your host, Gray Waste Tim, and you are in the den of the Gray Waste. Uh, I will be joined in a little bit by David Lightbringer, who is being classic Dave. It's okay to be late to your own channel, Dave, but here in the gray waste, we are prompt. <laughs> but uh, he's uh, he's eating a sandwich. Hello, all. <laughs> um, today, we're going to be reading a Tyrion chapter from Dance, uh, Dance with Dragons. Um, I'm pivoting away from the Dornish chapter, still going to be doing them, but... In honor of the Dunkin' Egg stories, uh, Dunkin' Egg has been casted. We know we're getting a Dunkin' Egg show. Uh, I've also decided that I want to try and cover a lot of the Blackfire chapters, things that have hidden Blackfire information. Of, of course, like uh, for if you don't know, I'm a big fan of the Blackfire rebellions. I think the Blackfire side story is some of the most interesting lore that George has given us, and the Dunkin' Egg stories are where we get the bulk of our black fire information. Hey, Damon, everyone thinks that you're named for Damon Blackfire, but you chose to be a Targaryen. <laughs> Even though it's obvious he's, he's got like the, the white tip at his end of his tail, like a little, little flame tip. He is a, I had Damon Blackfire in mind, but no, you, you chose to be Targaryen. <laughs> anyway, so uh Duncan egg. Yes. The first Duncan Egg story, the Hedge Knight, the shadow of the first Blackfire Rebellion still looms large in the background. And of course, we get more information on that in the Sworn Sword. And so we get to the third Black, the third Duncan Egg story, the Mystery Knight, where we are straight up in a Blackfire Rebellion. And then in years after that, when Egg is a teenager, he and Dunk and his older brother, Arian Targaryen, will personally fight in the third Blackfire Rebellion under the command of their father, Makar. And then again, in the fourth Blackfire Rebellion, when Egg, when Egg becomes king, he will personally fight in the fourth Blackfire Rebellion. He personally leads his army, again with Dunk and with his own sons. And then Aegon will pass, Egg will pass, but his son, Jaehaerys, when he takes the throne, we'll fight the fifth Blackfire Rebellion. He takes the war to the Stepstones. Uh, he takes the war to the Stepstones uh, because the fifth Blackfire Rebellion is part of the more overarching War of the Nine Penny Kings. And then when we get to our main story, there is heavy, heavy, heavy implications about the character that we know as Fagon, that he may or may not be a Blackfire. And a lot of that comes from Illyrio. Um, Illyrio and Varys have very intricate plans that they want to pop up together. But in this duo, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And Illyrio tends to let a lot slip. He's the one where the, the mask falters a bit. And, and Illyrio, he, he talks too much. Um, he's very, he's very flamboyant. He's very, he's very camp. He's like, and that's why, again, the big villain, evil mentor program, uh, Illyrio is the big villain, but he's more like, ooh, 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 uh, evil with his intricate plans. And then Tyrion, um, as George has said, George has, has, uh, referred to Tyrion as a villain. It's something that the show did not go into. We get Tyrion as a drunk and less clever, but not so dark. And I don't know if that's because Dave and Dan were reluctant to make a fan favorite character go down the sort of dark road that he goes down. I don't know if it was something in like Peter Dinklage's contract of I, I'm not going to play villains. I don't see that. I think Peter Dinklage would have done dark Tyrion had he been given the material. So I tend to blame, put more of the blame there on Dan and Dave, but that's because, you know, they're so incompetent. It's easy to blame them. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't get the darker Tyrion that we get in dance. That is not on the show. Um, but, but uh, Tyrion had, has been referred to as a villain by George himself. So big villain, evil mentor, Illyrio, Tyrion, uh, taken under his wing. And and 
with Illyrio, we get a lot of Blackfire information. So much, in fact, that at this point, when it comes to the character of Fagon, you would have a harder time trying to convince me that that kid is not a Blackfire at this point because of how much Illyrio talks about them and how much he lets out. Because let's just say, like, if, if Fagon's not a Blackfire, then there are a lot of coincidences happening. Too many coincidences to be to, to really say um, for him to not be, and and we will see that here with Illyrio, and even more so in the second Tyrion chapter in dance when he and Illyrio are traveling with the baggage train before uh, Tyrion gets on the Roin. So much Blackfire information is let out there. Um. And before, while we're still waiting on Dave, while I, before we go live, I do want to read, um, I got a PayPal uh, before, and I will also, there is a link to PayPal, if you would like to support the program, if you have a question or comment, um, there is a link to my PayPal in the video info. I also made sure I finally got my super chat. Uh, speak of it, yeah, I finally got my super chats enabled, and we got our first, our very first one from Miss Mod. There, five dollars. Thank you very much. Yes, that is that would be my first uh, super chat, super sticker. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you, Miss Mod. Earth. And uh, yes, and I also had a PayPal come in from Alexander, uh, paying it forward for someone gifting me a membership to LML. Thanks for everything that you do. I hope you have an excellent week. See you around. Thank you very much, Alexander. Same to you. I hope you have a great week. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. It's like uh, somebody pay, somebody gifted you a membership to Dave. So it's like you took the $5 you would have given him and given it to me instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. But yes, yes, if, if you would also like to support the program again, uh, PayPal link, my PayPal.me, the link to that is in the video info. And yes, super chats and super stickers are now enabled for all streams going forward. Uh, they're not necessary, but they are very much appreciated. <laughs> and, uh, oh, so we just, I'm sorry, just wait and be right. Be right there. Okay. <laughs> Tim, tool man, gray waste. <laughs> thank you. And $5 from Kirsty. Th just because. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, uh, um, I'm slowly learning and navigating my way through this whole YouTube thing. But I like to think like with every, every stream and every video, we get a little bit better. And that's, that's all we can really hope for. Oh, and he drank his way across the narrow sea. Oh, have we started? <laughs> What's going on? David Lightbringer on my channel. Isn't this a change? <laughs> hey there, Mr. Tim. Hello, Dave. Yes. Yes. So this was a last minute um, thing because uh, I was expecting to do this solo, but I'm very happy to have you, especially in a chapter like this. Uh we will be talking a lot about booze and mushrooms in this chapter. <laughs> I don't know. Does this, is my name displayed on the screen? I've named myself Shroom Boot for the day. Shroom Boot. Yeah, you have to hit display the names. It's okay. What's up there? Friends of Tim. Friends <laughs> of the Tim channel. Also known as friends of my channel as well because we're all family. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I... I I, I I am at peace with the fact that my most of my most if not all of my subs are probably ones that have look no you have look somewhere in this crowd there are like three people that hate the crap out of like how <laughs> I pause or something and they, they like my analysis but they can't stand my birds and they uh, they find refuge in the Tim channel and they're now tuning out they're like damn it can't get away from that Lightbringer guy oh anyways hi <laughs> hi everyone yeah is people... that did I see Crow Food's daughter in the chat. Yes, uh, she does. She does pop in occasionally. <laughs> That's dope. I thought I saw her icon. <laughs> We're all big fans of Crow Food's daughter around here. The new yep. uh, Valerian Steel video. Check that out. That was fun. 
But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about Tyrion being literally. So you've heard of in his cups. Tyrion is in the whole cask. He is <laughs> he's in the cask. <laughs> that's that's what we're reading, right? Yes. So we are reading Tyrion one. Not Tyrion 2 or Tyrion 3, 5 is straight out. <laughs> but I did watch your, your Cersei stream. I caught your Cersei stream this morning when you started when you were reading the wrong chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's okay. <laughs> we, we did do that. They get they get with they get confusing. They all just say Tyrion, they all just say Cersei. There's no unless you know you're on the right page. But yes, uh Tyrion. Tyrion has a lot of chapters in A Dance with Dragons, more so than any other single POV character. Well, kind of the way Cersei dominates Feast, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, was look, I was looking at chapters to read for my own channel, and I was looking at these Tyrion chapters, and so I, I glanced over this. This one is a lot of inner monologue until the last quarter of the chapter when him and Illyrio get down to talking. And then the second Tyrion chapter is like all him and Illyrio talking the whole time. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then, yeah. So it's, what Tyrion does is he kind of does like a speed run around half the world. He, in this chapter, he's crossing the narrow sea. He makes his way to Pentos. He has his weekend at Illyrio's, which is what I titled the stream. Um, then after this, he travels with Illyrio en route to the Roin. Tyrion, by Tyrion 3, he is on the Roin now with Fagon and crew. Uh, he has a stopover in Atlantis. He boards another ship where he meets Makoro and Penny. He winds up, uh, he's sold in, into slavery to a Yunkish slaver to Yezen, the Yellow Whale. And then he finds himself with the Second Sons uh, en route to Marine. So it's like he he just speed runs his way across. And every, new ch every Tyrion chapter, it's like he's in a new place, just hopping along the continent to finally get to Danny. Oh, I realized how I confused myself. I've got like the, my own uh, Twitter message icons right next to the chat icons. I was looking at Crow Food's daughter's, uh, the last message I sent her and I, oh. my brain just swapped the icons. I'm sorry, but she does drop in. Maybe I could, maybe I will summon her uh, with the force. <laughs> but uh, of course, if anyone doesn't know, you know, if you like Tim and my style of analysis, the disputed lands is the channel we're talking about. And uh, Amanda, a.k.a. Crowfood's daughter, makes great videos over there. Definitely, like I said, if you like our stuff, you'd like her stuff. So, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Um, we got another cheap super chat from No Sage. Cersei really had me bent over a barrel, Varys. Thanks for getting me out of there, said Tyrion. Uh, you had me over a barrel. You're ready to pulverize me with your thrusting manhood. That Varys <laughs> does not have because he's a human. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep. <laughs> So we can get right. Oh, and um, oh, can no. I say something real quick, Tim, oh, about sure. what we're doing tomorrow? Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, you were. We both did the same thing. Go ahead to make your announcement first, and then I'll. Oh, I was just going to say with the mushrooms thing, and this that becomes a big point of this chapter. Um, as I did with the last stream when I read the Ario Hota chapter, and I'm going to have you back for the Watcher. Um, we're always looking for. So when we're looking for symbolism, what we're looking in these sorts of chapters where we don't have weirwoods and others, but we do have the sense of them because we look for substitutes. Ario Hota, a silent what being the silent watcher, a shadow on the wall, um, and being from a, a foreigner from a cold city like Norvos is fits the role of, of a stand-in other. And the red mountains on the white sands of Dorne are like a weirwood stand in in a place where weirwoods would not grow. And the same thing is here in Penthouse. Now, we'll find the, I'm sure we'll find the other thing here, but it's the mushrooms. The mushrooms are the big one as our weirwood stand in because, as you and I have discussed, the weirwoods function also, as much as being trees, they function a lot like mushrooms. Their root systems are like a fungal network. Um, I've brought up the fungi from Yagoth from Lovecraft a lot. And it's like, it's like if you were to splice a mushroom with a tree, a weirwood is what you is what you get. Yeah, they look like trees, kind of, but yeah, mm -hmm. some some have questioned that. <laughs> yeah, but our three when it comes to mushrooms, our three big th uh, our three big categories for mushrooms would be ones that are edible, 
ones that are poisonous and ones that are hallucinogenic. They make you see, they make you see things. And George really treads, especially in this chapter, he treads a fine line between all three. And because all because they all they all come up and in their own way. And so we'll also be looking for that. Uh, George slipping in some more, some some of the psychotropic stuff with with the mushrooms and how that relates to Weirwood. George is also a fan of Alice in Wonderland and has used references to Alice uh, in a few places. So I don't have any insights like set up ahead of time, but I bet if we sort of keep an eye out for that, um, we might find like some weird dark inversion of it right because Tyrion is going he just went through the looking glass a little bit like he was in one world and he got stuffed into a tiny place and then he's popping out the other almost like a tunnel and he's now in a new world where everything is different so it, it could make sense potentially if Martin is playing with those ideas so we should probably watch out for that but then yeah my announcement before we start I don't know if I can share my screen do I have a way to do that? Let's see. Oh, present. Yes, present. Share screen. This is going to be a, a tab. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, no, I've got many tabs. Windows. This is <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I was looking at all my tabs. Can you see that? Uh, no, Little finger? I had it. I had to add it myself, but oh, yes, okay. there we are. Yes. So this is what we're doing tomorrow uh, <laughs> on my channel. And we're also going to have girl nettles with us. So it'll be all three of us to tear apart this disgusting man known as Littlefinger. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will involve Sansa, but I didn't want to call this the Littlefinger and Sansa stream because Sansa deserves her own stream uh, apart from this monster. <laughs> so this will be the Littlefinger stream and uh, I've got an outline going. Maynard Plum's helped me with that. We're going to do a little bit of dramatic reading. I'm sure Girl Nettles will do something with the Lysa confesses everything before getting thrown out the moon door scene, which we will read. Uh, Tim will have his best Peter Baelish voice ready, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's what we'll do tomorrow. It's going to be pretty delightful. I've been putting this off for long enough. It's it's an interesting topic, but obviously it's a slimy topic. So yeah, it's just somehow I kept talking about dragons and Jon Snow and RLJ, but we're good. We're going to do this tomorrow. So come on through. We'll like, like I said, girl nettles will be there and we'll definitely have a lot of fun and whoop it up and all that stuff. So there you go. Yep. Now back to our regular scheduled program. All right. So yeah, and uh, I will work on a little finger voice, something, a mix of weaselly and pompous to get that down. And I'm not sure which, I'll, I'll know tomorrow what sections you want us to read, but amazingly, there is a bit of Blackfire stuff mixed in with little finger. It crops up in Sansa's uh, Winds of Winter sample chapter. So depending on if... Yeah, well, we're going to go through a lot of talking about little fingers, like just going through all of his various schemes and all the people that he has damaged in each scheme and how he's using the various people involved. So we will, of course, get to his end game scheme and talk about, you know, what's going on in the veil. So yeah, that'll be, it sounds like a good three hours to me and that'll be uh, that'll be normal time. So three Pacific, six Eastern. And uh, if you're, if that time doesn't work for you, then just catch it on the rewatch. All right, sounds good. So we will see every. I hope we will see everyone that's here today at Dave Stream tomorrow for little fin for little finger character study, and yeah, that'll that'll be a good time. I'm uh, having you read Little Finger, Tim, because you are your vibes are so safe and friendly that like you <laughs> you will not be slimed with Little Finger. I'm worried that you know, like I asked people who I looked like when I had long hair before I cut it. It was like. <laughs> I was getting stuff like brawn. As somebody said, little finger. I used to have more of a pointed beard, I guess, and like yeah. just all villains, you know. So I can. I'm going to read Sansa. Just <laughs> okay. Excuse y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now you're reading Rhaegar doing an egg cosplay. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. I think I've accepted myself fully. Yes, I'm. I'm Rhaegar doing an egg cosplay. That is kind of correct. <laughs> so. I guess yep. you're going to do Illyrio, so I guess I'll do Tyrion. 
Because those are yeah, kind of I mean, main speakers. For the first part, since you said it, since it's a lot of Tyrion talking to himself, we can sort of back yeah. and forth, back we'll and forth we'll on that. Take turns with the inner model. That's kind of what I was thinking. Because like I yeah. said, the dialogue's when, mostly at the end. Yeah, but when we get to the di- when we get to when they're having dinner, yes, I will be. I have. That was another big reason I wanted to do this. It's just because I've had a little Lirio voice in mind for a while, <laughs> and I wanted to do it. Oh, uh, Tim, we love your acting enthusiasm. Yep. Oh, thank you very much. I love doing it. So. Dave right. looks like how I imagine leathers to look. Leathers is pretty freaking cool. I will say that. <laughs> that's cool. That's 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 a new one. I've not heard that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I will accept Renly. I will accept grown up Renly when I have a certain look going on. I do look vaguely Baratheon like, and I'm not really Robert esque. So, <laughs> and I appreciate not calling me Stannis. That's nice of you. So, anyway. <laughs> Go All ahead. Right. So 20 minutes in, we'll start the chapter. Yeah, <laughs> Tyrion that's, one. sounds about right. He drank his way across the narrow sea. The ship was small, his cabin smaller, but the captain would not allow him above decks. The rocking of the deck beneath his feet made his stomach heave, and the wretched food tasted even worse when wretched back up. But why did he need salt beef, hard cheese, and bread crawling with worms when he had wine to nourish him? It was red and sour very strong sometimes he heaved the wine up too but there was always more the world is full of wine he muttered in the dankness of his cabin his father never had any use for drunkards but what did that matter his father was dead he killed him a bolt in the belly my lord and all for you if only i was better with a crossbow i would have put it through that cock you made me with you bloody bastard so yeah so we go a feast for crows. We go a full book without Tyrion. So now here we are, and this is just him fresh after killing Tywin, the flight in the night afterwards, and just all of the feelings that he he is carrying. It's like you're gonna carry that weight, and he has just been drinking himself into a stupor. All the way across, yep. And it's gonna like it's gonna take him a minute to. This chapter is basically him coming out of that. It's mostly his lowest point. Uh, and there is the scene where he R words and abuses the uh, serving mm. woman, Hilario's serving woman, totally not a slave. And uh, so, yeah, this it, at the very end of the chapter, he's finally like come into grips with the real world. Like, he's yeah, he's just traumatized. His whole world got thrown in like. Not only did he murder his father, which even if you hate your father, I'm assuming that murdering your father is like kind of, you know, it brings a lot of turmoil up. And there was a whole Taisha thing where it was revealed that, I mean, that's really the awful part. Like, Mm -hmm. it's an awful story that just got way more awful because Tyrion has learned that she did love him and that she was an innocent victim uh and that jamie was essentially complicit in this although really jamie's a victim at his age tywin making him complicit is victimizing jamie more than anything but this like Tyrion's reaction to all that is very understandable like to dive into substance abuse he's already you know wine is his preferred escape as it is so it makes sense that he would do that and yeah he has no idea where he's going or what's happening he took Varys's, you know, escape because what other option was open to him? Uh, but he doesn't know where he's going and he kind of doesn't care. It's going to take him a while to start caring again, really. Mm-hmm. It's not until Fagon gets his political juices flowing with this, he's, you know, finds some more political subterfuge. And it's just so interesting and delicious that it sort of gets gets him back into caring about stuff. But we see that with Penny you know, as a foil to Tyrion, as someone who cares very much and is very earnest. And Tyrion is just going back and forth between like, you know, maybe he's motivated by hate. Maybe he's motivated by interest in politics. Maybe he just doesn't care. So he's, yeah. 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 And I did mention in the intro, I'm not sure if you heard, so I'd like to ask your opinion on this. It seems like the show with their version of Tyrion seemed to have a reluctance to take him down this darker path. Instead of getting darker, he sort of got dumber. Oh, yeah. Uh, Peter Dinklage just did way too marvelous of a job. Although he 
honestly, if you look at his performance in the trial, where that was where we saw Book Tyrion mm-hmm. the most, I feel like, you know, when he was, I mean, what a performance if you go back and watch that. Yeah. Uh, so the, he would have ate up the Dark Tyrion material. But yeah, it's Tim, it's all in service to the Dark Danny ending. And this is more <laughs> evidence that it's not going to be the same in the books. In yeah. the books, Tyrion is clearly going to be the devil on Danny's shoulder, the one counseling her to more violence, the one who hates the shit out of everyone in King's Landing and would love to see them all die, um, especially if Cersei is the one in, in charge. So mm-hmm. they turned Tyrion into the nice guy so that Danny could be the bloodthirsty one. Um, but it's, but of course, in the books, it's obvious that Tyrion is bloodthirsty and Danny is more cautious. Um, so yeah, it's just basically a total inversion and yeah, I mean, um, uh, alt shift X pretty much set the record straight is who is the real Tyrion video is tremendous and inspired me to do my, who is the real Danny video. Mm. And that was the main thing that he first pointed out is like show Tyrion becomes, uh, naive and dumb. He's not clever anymore. He's not scheming. He's not ruthless. And he, all he ever does is like plead for mercy and and restraint and that's just not the character in the books at all so no not at all and yeah you like you said with the with dnd's handling of danny and the and their explanation of like well the seeds were there you know she killed the slaver she killed randall tarley and then we as an audience were like we were supposed to care about those people we wanted them dead so it was it was just very clumsily handled the entire way to try and make Danny into Dragon Hitler. Yeah, and even the Randall Tarley thing, it's like, okay, so Ned would have laid him down on a stump and chopped his head off for insubordination. Danny fed him to his dragon. Like, I mean, it's a little bit over the top, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it's one of those, it's meant to remind us of Ares, you know, burning people and stuff. So it's... There's a little touch of insanity there, but like in the end, like it's pretty rational what she's doing. She's not doing um like we, I was I was talking to someone about spanking me back in the eighties. Children were spanked. I don't think we do that anymore. Um, mostly early nineties. Early I got early nineties still. I got it. <laughs> but even with the people that advocated for spanking. Um, there was always a uh, delineation made between spanking in anger versus this is your punishment. We're going to do this and it's whatever. Um, I experienced both as a child. And let me say that it is very different when an angry parent just sort of like grabs you and starts spanking you and they're screaming at you versus <laughs> like, you know, that if you do something, it's five spanks and like you did it and that's your punishment and you take it like a man or whatever. Like, so there's kind of um what were we talking about why did i get on that why am i talking about my childhood tim help me <laughs> um where were you going with that and even uh randall tar uh, we were talking about randall tarley <laughs> yes yeah i think that's it um no that well what about randall tarley though about how Ra- about how danny burning randall tarley was supposed to be a sign uh, yes for right madness. so danny is Danny is doing a calculated action. Like she said, bend the knee and acknowledge my dominion Mm. or you will be a tainted, a traitor and you will be executed. And that's no different than any Lord or conquering person in Westeros would do. Um, So it's not like she uh, was like talking to Randall Tarly and negotiating with him and then in a rage has her dragon eat him which would be like holy crap dude you don't have control over yourself and your dragons and if you get angry you just like lash out with your dragons like that's not exactly what happened that's what they tried to set up with the last scene right where like Mm -hmm. she's won but somehow she's upset and she just gets angry and just decides to burn people or something right we shouldn't probably get too much too lost on that but oh. yeah uh, the one last one last thing i will say about randall tarley though is that in the book he may also be a traitor the way you had stated uh because he is possibly one of these friends in the reach that we get a line about from the golden company and his his uh his dislike of the tyrells 
uh, the way they handle things and his mistrust of them, his, his, uh, the way he looks at Mace, he has no respect for him. He thinks that Tyrells are run by women. And then his role as master of laws, if he is a friend of the reach, makes him a inside guy. He would be like a mole on the on the small council. And it'd be another thing of something that's being overlooked by Cersei despite her paranoia. And something I wanted to point out, like when you did your Cersei stream and you did, you did a great job of bringing it up is Cersei's paranoia. But there is that line... Um, I know it because of Nirvana, rest in peace, Kurt Cobain, but it's uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. And that is the situation that Cersei finds herself in. Well, it's the same with Ares, too. Like, they are plotting against Ares. <laughs> it's like, yeah, some of this, some of this crazy talk of yours actually is justified. <laughs> but anyway, so continuing back on, uh, below decks, there was neither night nor day. Tyrion marked time by the comings and goings of the cabin boy who brought the meals he did not eat. The boys always brought a brush and bucket too to clean up. Is this Dornish wine? Tyrion asked him once as he pulled a stopper from a skin. It reminds me of a certain snake I knew. A droll fellow. Till a mountain fell on him. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> Just exactly how Oberyn went down. The cabin boy did not answer. He was an ugly boy, though admittedly more comely than a certain dwarf with half a nose and a scar from eye to chin. Have I offended you? Tyrion asked as the boy was scrubbing. Were you commanded not to talk to me, or did some dwarf diddle your mother? That went unanswered, too. Where are we sailing? Tell me that. Jamie had made mention of the free cities, but had never said which one. Is it Bravos, Tyrosh, Mir? Tyrion would sooner have gone to Dorne. Marcella is older than Tommen. By Dornish law, the Iron Throne is hers. I will help her claim her rights, as Prince Oberyn suggested. And I do want to take a time here because, uh, so for those who don't know, the next serious video on my channel, I'm working on both serious and funsies, but the next serious one will be the follow-up to Blood and Citrus, Lies and Citrus, uh, Danny and the Lemon Trees, and how those, and really looking at how those lemon trees cannot be in Bravos. So the mentioning here of Tyrosh, Mir, and Dorne, those are all candidates of, again, places where weirwoods wouldn't grow, but contenders for lemon trees. And the way that Tyrion brings up, he would sooner have gone to Dorne. There is the idea that Danny was not in Bravos, that she was smuggled to Dorne instead. That's one that I disagree with. I think that's Doran Martell keeping his keeping his chickens a few, a little too close to home, especially knowing Bobby B is on the hunt for Targaryens. But definitely the other free cities are contenders for where where she was, and it's just mixing Bravos up. I'm still trying to figure out why it matters. Like her, she she we know that she fled from all these narrow cities from the different free cities from one to the other mm -hmm. at different times. And I'm just not sure. And I'm not saying that dismissively, like there is some chicanery here. And I just don't understand what the point of it is. Like what is where, where the house with the red door, like where, where is it? I just, I don't see why that's important. Um, the way I look at it is is uh, George playing on the nostalgia factor when it comes to Danny because Danny's looking for a place. Danny's looking for home. She's looking for a place of peace. She's never known home besides the house with the red door. But if the house with the red door, which she seems to think was in Bravos, is actually a false memory, then it then it undercuts Danny by stating, "Well, you never really had home to begin with because even your idealized version of home." was a lie that could make sense um because her her quest for home and belonging got grafted on to Viserys's quest for westeros and mm -hmm. so now she's looking at conquering westeros as a way of fulfilling that desire for belonging and home and legacy and and family and all that but that's that's false she needs to give up ultimately pursuit of the iron throne and realize that she has dragons in order to save the world um so Maybe this is a realization that will help 
separate that for her or maybe this has to do with danny seeing illyrio for who he is fully you know mm -hmm. if his some of his lies get exposed um but uh yeah i i i can't truck with the theories that like try to make danny a black fire or not who she's supposed to be i just um i feel like the story falls apart if mm -hmm. if daenerys is not daenerys targaryen i really do like i just don't well you know there's there's a line from i can't believe i'm saying it it's a line from joe dirt of all things but the line is home is where you make it and that actually s seems like something that would stick well with danny and something that if her idea of home is also a lie the realization she needs to come to is like look uh, if you're not going to have this idealized idea but you can make anywhere your home home is where you make it you need to find a spot where you feel safe and comfortable and happy and can build there and then the dragon can can garden the dragon can plant trees Kyle father de bears is confused he heard you say homo's naked and he's he's one of his <laughs> Folsom <laughs> street fair in San Francisco <laughs> or like no, um, <laughs> you're totally right. That is what Danny does. And I've pointed out that what she actually does is since she doesn't have home and a sense of belonging, she provides it to other people and mm -hmm. scratches that itch that way by being the Misa to all these refugees, even in, in the Dothraki with the, you know, the slaves that she's protecting. She's trying to give other orphans and refugees home and protection since she didn't have it herself, kind of. And that, to me, is one of the most beautiful things about her character. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much you want to talk about Black uh, Danny Blackfire theory. I just, like I said, it doesn't make any sense to me. And when you look at her symbolism, I'm not, I don't see any clues about it. I've looked at Danny's material a lot, and I just, I feel like I would have picked it up. Um, but, yeah. I don't know. No. So... Would you like so since I'm not doing all the reading, would you like to pick yeah, up? Yeah, I'll take a I'll take a turn here. All right. So Oberyn was dead. Oberyn was dead, though. His head smashed to bloody ruin by the armored fist of Sir actually by his thumbs and fist. There's multiple <laughs> smashings. Uh by Cl Sir Gregor Clegane. And without the Red Viper to urge him on, would Dorn Martell even consider such a chancy scheme? Might clap me in chains instead and hand me back to my sweet sister. The wall might be safer. Old Bear Mormont said the Night's Watch had need of men like Tyrion. Mormont might be dead, though. By now, Slint might be the Lord Commander. That butcher's son was not like to have forgotten who sent him to the wall. <laughs> Do I really want to spend the rest of my life eating salt, beef, and porridge with murderers and thieves? Not that the rest of his life would last very long. Jano Slint would see to that. The cabin boy wet his brush and scrubbed on manfully. Have you ever visited the pleasure houses of Lys? The dwarf inquired. Might be, might that be where whores go? Tyrion could not seem to recall the Valerian word for whore, and in any case, it was too late. The boy tossed his brush back into his bucket and took his leave. The wine has blurred my wits. He had learned to read High Valerian at his maester's knee, though what they spoke in the nine free cities, well, it was... Not so much a dialect as nine dialects on the way to becoming nine separate tongues. Tyrion had some bravosi and a smattering of Mirish. In Tyrosh, he should be able to curse the gods, call a man a cheat, and order up an ale, thanks to a sellsword he had once known at the Rock. At least in Dorne, they speak the common tongue. Like Dornish food and Dornish law, Dornish speech was flavored or spiced with the flavors of the Roin, but a man could comprehend it. Dorn, yes, Dorn for me. He crawled into his bunk, clutching that thought like a child with a doll. Yeah, and so the spice, the spice that comes to Dornish speech, are the bad Spanish accents that I that I give to Dorin Martell when I read them. But yeah, and so Tyrion is saying like, uh, and and that is that is a real thing. The way that language language and language groups can splinter off. There are different dialects. Someone may speak in a different accent or have a different different way of doing things. Different colloquials. Uh, there's like pigeon pigeon English things like that. Like we're speaking English now, but if we were to go down to Louisiana, we might have meet somebody who's throwing in some Cajun words. And technically they're still speaking English, but you have no idea. Oh, good Lord, I got a lot of shrimp. I got a good shrimp, and all of a sudden we land, I got a lot of my shrimp. Oh, good Lord. 
Okay, sir, I think you're telling me something about shrimp. I just want a po' boy. <laughs> uh, is that for those of you who remember South Park? They had a, they did an episode with the um, the about the Gulf oil spill, and there was some shrimp shrimp guy complaining about all the oil and the shrimp, and it was just like it's <laughs> it's the best. Anyway, so sleep had never come easily to Tyrion Lannister. Aboard that ship, it seldom came at all, though from time to time he managed to drink sufficient wine to pass out for a while. At least he did not dream. He had dreamt enough for one small life. And of such follies, love, justice, friendship, glory, as well dream of being tall. It was all beyond his reach, Tyrion knew now, but he did not know where whores go. Wherever whores go, his father had said, his last words, and what words they were. The crossbow thrummed. Lord Tywin sat back down, and Tyrion Lannister found himself waddling through the darkness with Varys at his side. He must have clambered back down the shaft, 230 rungs to where orange embers glowed in the mouth of an iron dragon. He remembered none of it. Only the sound the crossbow made and the stink of his father bowels opening. Even in his, in his dying, he found a way to shit on me. All right, so, so let's um, mm-hmm. let's pause for a second and appreciate Lord Tywin's messy death. <laughs> really, just fitting, you know. Couldn't happen to a worse guy, and uh, you know, just a terrible person. Tywin, a final four contestant in our villains tourney. Just a terrible person. No, actually, what I wanted to point out, Tim, was George's mm-hmm. uh, writing technique, which is known as in late, out early. And this is one of the best writing techniques to help young writers. If you haven't heard this, it's just brilliant. And if you have, then you know what's up. But basically, you don't have to write every step of it in linear order. It's much more interesting if you don't. So Tyrion's story left off with the crossbow b- thwang. And it picks up in the boat. But we're being fed the stuff that happened in between via flashback in little bits that are interspiced in Tyrion's inner monologue in ways that make sense. And George does this in almost every chapter. So the last time you left a character, he was somewhere or she was somewhere. And then we pick them up. They're skipped ahead. And then as they're going into this chapter, they're remembering and flashing back to the stuff that they just did. And this allows George to cleverly juxtapose multiple scenes on top of each other and and the ideas and symbols and shapes in those scenes then get juxtaposed too. And so this is just a standard technique that you can do to make it more interesting and less, and then A happened and then B happened and then C happened and then D happened, which, you know, sounds like a kindergartner writing. So in late out early, George is a master of it. And Mm -hmm. this is... You know, you can also write more stylistically in these sort of little memory glimpses like, oh, he, you know, there was 230 rungs and a a glowing embers in the mouth of an iron dragon and the smell of shit and the thwang of the crossbow. Just these little shapes and colors that are coming back. So it makes the writing a little bit psychedelic or more impressionist or surrealistic, you know, surreal, you might want to say, dreamlike. Tyrion's drunk right here, Mm -hmm. so his memories are swimming around. And uh, George dials this sort of stuff up and down based on how the character's experience is happening. So if they're under the influence of something or if they're in a mysterious type of place, this sort of writing gets dialed up and it becomes more dreamlike. Um, And so, yeah, that's, you know, Ned's Tower of Joy, literally a dream, you know, the way it fades back into reality, stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. just want to point that out because... George is a brilliant writer, and it's just fun to put your finger on what he's doing to make it uh, like it is sometimes. Yeah. And as another relation to Dunk to the Dunkin' Egg stories, too, uh, Tyrion's flight out of King's Landing down these narrow tunnels interlaced with talk of Tywin's bowels. It can kind of give you the sense of the dwarf and blood ravens employ from, from the Mystery Knight who crawls up through the privy to get to the dragon's egg. Oh, interesting. You're totally right. You're totally right. What's he saying about that? What's what's the parallel there? <laughs> well, <laughs> see, that's because I think this is like, I mean, in in a 
in a way, Tyrion's flight down the tunnels after Ty through after Tywin's bowels loosen and his his uh darker turn here, it is like a highbrow way of saying that Tyrion is turning to shit. Yeah, he's going through the bowels of the castle. Mm. Very much so. Um, I was thinking about that. <laughs> uh <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like almost like the poison that's probably in Tywin's bowels. Yeah. Uh, Which is so. is one of the other things that we don't talk too much about in A Song of Ice and Fire, but it's what I call highbrow dick jokes and George actually does tend to set to lay a lot of them to lay a lot of them in here. Just like like how can I do like the lowest form of toilet humor but still make it but still make it sound poetic it's a mix of like lit nerd and and toilet humor quite often yes that is yeah. that's well put very well put <laughs> so because george but, uh, is he has he has dirty hands um mm -hmm. but you know grimy hands from crawling around the mud but he's read all the classics too so <laughs> it's my my kind of my kind of writing yeah, and we're not above we're not above shoveling through the muck here on this channel. <laughs> so Varys had escorted him through the tunnels, but they never spoke until they emerged beside the black water, where Tyrion had won a famous victory and lost a nose. That was when the dwarf turned to the eunuch and said, I've killed my father. In the same tone a man might use to say, <laughs> I've stubbed my toe. The Master of Whispers had been dressed as a begging brother in a moth-eaten robe of brown rough spun with a cowl that shadowed his smooth fat cheeks and bald around head. You should not have climbed that ladder, he said reproachfully. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold, hold on a second. Varys has a begging brother costume? This seems like one of those details that's thrown in here that's easy to miss. Mm-hmm. Because all of Varys' disguises, they're like cosplays that a cosplayer accumulates. He uses Rugen. He uses, I think there's one other one we've seen. Um, but but yeah, this, um, he has a begging brother costume. Okay, so I was just thinking, he uses his little birds for information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, in a way, is the big bird the high sparrow if you will okay and i'm not saying that varis is the high sparrow but if he has a begging brother costume he certainly could be coming and going and talking to the high sparrow whether that is in a direct conspiracy or varis just posing as a brown brother that's got working his way up inside the faith and having influence or keeping an eye on the high sparrow or giving him ideas what do you think is there a connection here yeah, and because I do want to comment, like on your Cersei, when you read the Cersei stream, we also hear of Rugen, which we know is another one of Varys's aliases. But the description we're given of Rugen the Jailer is in such stark contrast to Varys. He's he has a beard. He's big and burly. People say he's mean, like he he's he has rough edges. And then his chamber pot is full, which is not something we think we would think of the very uh dapper lavender smelling Varys. I bet you Varys, I bet you Varys like is one of those dudes where he's got a lot of muscle but he's kind of pudgy and mm -hmm. so depending on how he holds himself, he might look like a pudgy dude or like kind of a brawny dude. That's interesting yeah. to think about. But what I'm getting at here is like cuz of Varys's role as a mummer, as a former actor, makes sense that he'd have all these costumes, but it also means that we we technically can't say for sure if we know who the true Varys is because that lilac, lavender smelling, uh, soft, soft handed Eggman that we know is just another costume. There's also just an act. And so we, we really don't know what Illyrio, when he drop when he drops the act, what he really is like. And that's, and that's why I'm saying like what, or Varys, I'm sorry, I said Illyrio. Illyrio is the one who talks too much and lets the mask lets his mask slip way too often. Whereas Varys, Varys, for all we know, has probably been hiding his true self all along. That's interesting. And your chat is on fire right now. They're talking about all the costumes that Varys has. Someone's saying he's got an actual bird costume and he's a furry. <laughs> 
but um yeah i am curious if um and some people are wondering if maybe he was an escaped unsullied as opposed to that story he made up about his balls getting chopped off um i've never heard of that theory i don't know how an unsullied would escape but i guess it could happen somehow could he be using a glamour um i don't see any suggestion of that i don't see notable like rubies or jewels or any other indications he's doing sorcery i think he's a, just a mummer like he's literally mm -hmm. doing mummery and costume work and stuff yeah he has um, all this acting talent yeah, yeah he's a non-magical analog to a lot of things that are magical like he's got all that spider symbolism that's really talking about the others and whatnot but he's not really connected to them so yeah but I'm not sure about the Unsullied thing, but I will say that Varys and Illyrio, for that matter, they are both big men who are light on their feet. For Illyrio, we know, because Illyrio used to be a bravo, like uh, Sirio Fortel. Right. Um, so so he was, before True. he before he let his his, uh, his vices get the better of him, he would have been a very uh, lean, lithe, strapping man. And Varys could have been the same way back, back in their younger days. So, and we yeah, know that- and he wasn't always necessarily um, overweight to Shell Baxter. They say, and I don't know if this is true, but they say when talking about the unsullied that eunuchs will run heavy if they don't exercise because I guess their testosterone isn't the same or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that could be consistent with the in-world eunuch science or whatever. And Varys also used to be a thief. And it's not like he was just some some guy. I mean, he's definitely pickpocketing people at times. But the way it's let on, like, a, a man's real treasures are his secrets. You get the more sense. Like, Varys was like a cat burglar. This was a guy who was scaling walls and climbing through, climbing up windows. Yeah. Probably did a lot of par parkour. Parkour. <laughs> like, yeah. That, yeah. I don't think he's an unsullied. I, I don't. That doesn't feel right to me. Um but the, I have wondered about this connection to the High Sparrow um, because there is a crossover in motivation there. Varys is serves the people in a very twisted way. It's not. It's very. It's not legit. Like he's he wants his preferred choice to be the king or whatever. Um, but he at least talks a game about Team Small Folk. Uh, and so kind of does the High Sparrow. So there, there could be some overlapping interests with Empower. And, and Varys is really just trying to cause chaos for Cersei, right? And mm -hmm. so if he's empowering, doing anything to empower the Sparrows and all that, that could make sense too. Yeah. And that is something, another thing that's come up is Varys. Oh, this could be where he's hiding April, May. Sorry, Tim. Mm -hmm. April, May in the chat is saying, you know, he's been missing you know, maybe he's handling the high sparrow. Maybe he's just hiding as a begging brother mm. or yeah, or not a begging brother, but one of the poor fellows. That yeah. would be a very good place to hide. There's yeah, so many of them and they're everywhere and everyone stays away from them because they're kind of crazy. And the high sparrow is definitely someone Varys would want to get more intel on to make his Fagon experiment a success. He this needs is a good have, theory. I like it. Yeah, he needs, he needs information. If his plan is to go is to go forward he needs to have information on all the other big power players sure and he's still in king's landing mm -hmm. so he can use go in and out of the red keep with his little tunnels and things through the bowels if you will cool this is good nice one april i think this theory might have legs so you should not have, all right wherever whores go Tyrion had warned his father not to say that word if i had not loosed he would have seen my threats were empty. He would have taken the crossbow from my hands as once he took Taisha from my arms. He was rising when I killed him. I killed Shay too, he confessed to Varys. You knew what she was. I did, but I never knew what he was. Varys tittered. And now you do. I should have killed the eunuch as well. A little more blood on his hands, what would it matter? He would not say what had stayed his dagger not gratitude. Varys had saved him from a headsman's sword, but only because Jamie had compelled him. Jamie, no. Better not to think of Jamie. He found a fresh skin of wine instead and sucked at it as if it were a woman's breast. The sour red ran down his chin and soaked through his soiled tunic, 
the same one he had been wearing in his cell. The deck was swaying beneath his feet, and when he tried to rise, it lifted sideways and smashed him hard against a bulkhead. A storm, he realized. Or else I am drunker than I knew. Or it's Euron. Elmo, oh, got a super chat from Bud Raven, Elmo, Kermit Grover, and Oscar Tolly, and then you get two big birds with lemon, lemon cloak as a big yellow bird in Varys. Ger yeah, <laughs> George does have a lot of fun, especially when it comes to those Muppet Tullys, but <laughs> Lem Lemon Cloak as a big and very, yeah, <laughs> the big, I guess now we're going to have to look at Varys like that. He's he's a big bird. He's just a, just tell her it's just a very big bird. So he retched the wine up and lay in it a while, wondering if the ship would sink. Is this your vengeance, father? Has the father above made you his hand? Such are the wages of the kinslayer, he said as the wind howled outside. It did not seem fair to drown the cabin boy and the captain and all the rest for something he had done. But when had the gods ever been fair? And around about then, the darkness gulped him down. So I just want to go back to that line where Tyrion is, or Varys is like, and now you do. Like, it's such a beautiful little bit. It's like um, everybody's mask has dropped here. You know, Tyrion's like, I just killed my father. And Varys is smuggling him out of the... There's no... We're not like... The masks are off. We're mm -hmm. speaking more plainly. And he's just like... Varys is like, yeah, you knew she was a, a sex worker. You know, mm -hmm. you knew she'd love you. And he's like, yeah, but I didn't realize my father was such a big hypocrite. <laughs> and Varys is like, well, <laughs> yep, I've been sitting on that one for years. It's pretty tasty, isn't it? <laughs> now yeah, you yeah. know about it. <laughs> yeah, the the tunnels to the bro the tunnels to the brothel, and whether whether or not Tywin was using those, which he more than likely was. Whether or not Tywin had them put in, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and that is another change too that the show made. Um, when Tyrion kills Shay in the show, they have her grab a dagger, so it gives sort of a sense of self-defense. Whereas in the book, like no, Tyrion straight up kills her. It was a cat was a cowardly change. That was the beginning of the whitewashing of his character. Like, oh, we just can't have him just murder a woman mm -hmm. for, in cold blood like that. Yep. Yep. George refers to Tyrion as a villain. It's probably the time to remind everyone before we get to that last scene, but uh, I'll take a turn reading now, so here we go. When he stirred again, his head felt like to burst, and the ship was spinning round in dizzy circles, though the captain was insisting they'd come to port. <laughs> the captain swore the ship had stopped, but Tyrion was like, I don't know about that. Seems like it's spinning around in circles to me. <laughs> Tyrion told him to be quiet, and kicked feebly at a huge bald sailor uh, as a huge bald sailor tucked him under one arm and carried him squirming to the hold where an empty wine cask awaited him. It was a squat little cask and a tight fit, even for a dwarf. Tyrion pissed himself in his struggles for all the good it did. Nice. That was smell good in there. He was crammed face first into the cask with his knees pushed up against his ears. Damn, dude. This I'm a mildly claustrophobic. This is hard to read. The stub of his nose itched horribly, but his arms were pinned so tightly he could not reach to scratch it. A palanquin fit for a man of my stature, he thought. As they hammered shut the lid, he could hear voices shouting as he was hoisted up. Every bounce cracked his head against the bottom of the cask. Oh, and he's drunk, too. This is so bad. <laughs> the world went round and round as the cask rolled downward, then stopped with a crash that made him want to scream. Another cask slammed into his and Tyrion bit his tongue. Oh, man. Okay. So Tyrion deserves all of this, but still, <laughs> like, as the reader, we're being forced to experience this. And that is, yeah, mildly claustrophobic, yeah. like I said. Uh, well, <laughs> that, it's go ahead. I was going to say, it's like, have you ever gone to the amusement park drunk and then got, a, got on the tilt-a-whirl? Because this is what's happening to Tyrion. <laughs> now, for symbolism goes here... Obviously, we're talking about his journey across the narrow sea as kind of like a through the looking glass moment. Um, there's a lot of cosmic axis stuff, right? The whole world is spinning, even though they're still. So that's mm -hmm. literally like you're looking up at the stars and they're spinning around. Um, and then the whole 
boats are often metaphors for the weirwood trees because they sail the green sea like the weirwoods navigate the river of time and all that stuff. So Tyrion is, yeah, the ship is spinning around in circles, though it, and his head feels like to burst. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Tyrion is like the moon or whatever he is, but he's inside, he's spinning like the world and he is being transported to a different world. So there's definitely some sort of, like I said, cosmic axis. Um, he's traversing the realms, something like that. Uh, and that's why all the spinning. So that was the longest journey he had ever taken, though it could not have lasted more than half an hour. He was lifted and lowered, rolled and stacked, upended and righted and rolled again. Oh, man. Being upside down would be the worst. Though the wooden staves, he heard men shouting. Through the wooden staves, he heard men shouting. And once a horse wickered nearby. His stunted legs began to cramp. And soon he heard so badly, he forgot the hammering in his head. Fun. It ended as it had begun, with another roll that left him dizzy and more jouncing. Outside, strange voices were speaking in a tongue he did not know. Someone started pounding on the top of the cask, and the lid cracked open suddenly. Light came flooding in, and cool air as well. Tyrion gasped, yeah, cool air. Dude, that, it did not smell good in there. He pissed himself right before he went in. <laughs> Light came flooding in, cool air as well. Tyrion gasped greedily and tried to stand, but only managed to knock the cask over sideways and spill himself out onto a hard-packed earthen floor. Must have been quite the sight. <laughs> and they did do this on the show, too, didn't they? Yeah, and I think they did. I have a visual of Peter Dinklage spilling out of a cask. Is yeah, they changed it though, so because they had Varys accompany Tyrion on the ship. Oh, right. They drop lines about Tyrion, like having, like having to, like squeeze his waist out through cracks in the wood, and then Elyria, and then I'm, I keep saying Elyria, and then Varys, I'd be like, yeah, and then I had to pick it up and throw it into the sea. But <laughs> so they, yeah, they. uh they changed it, but here, yeah, here, uh, it's Illyrio that comes gets him. Above him loomed a grotesque fat man with a forked yellow beard holding a wooden mallet and an iron chisel. His bedrobe was large enough to serve as a tourney pavilion, but its loosely knotted belt had come undone, exposing a huge white belly and a pair of heavy breasts that sagged like sacks of suet covered with horse yellow, with coarse yellow hair. So descriptive. Thank you too much. <laughs> like, yeah, Illyrio like you're right living... there in the moment. Yeah, your face smothered in Illyrio's chest. <laughs> Illyrio's man boobs. Him yeah. living the, my six hundred pound life. That's Illyrio. He reminded Tyrion of a dead sea cow that had once washed up in the caverns under Cast Casterly Rock. The fat man looked down and smiled. A drunken dwarf, he said in the common tongue of Westeros. A rotting sea cow. Tyrion's mouth was full of blood. He spat it at the fat man's feet. They were in a long, dim cellar with barrel vaulted ceilings, its stone walls spotted with nitre. Casks of wine and ale surrounded them, more than enough to drink, more than enough drink to see a thirsty dwarf safely through the night or through a life. You are insolent. I like that in a dwarf. When the fat man laughed, his flesh bounced so vigorously that Tyrion was afraid he might fall and crush him. Are you hungry, my little friend? Weary? Thirsty. Tyrion struggled to his knees and filthy. The fat man sniffed. A bath first, just so. Then food and a soft bed, yes. My servants shall see to it. <coughs> Jombie! His host put the mallet and chisel aside. My house is yours. Any friend of my friend across the water is a friend to Illyrio Mopatis, yes. And any friend of Varys the Spider is someone I will trust just as far as I can throw him. <laughs> so, love this dialogue. The, the exchanged, a drunken dwarf, a rotting sea cow. Like, that's just... I love how you could, you could stuff Tyrion in a cask, you know drunk and like flip him over for half an hour spill him out and he's still his game is right there <laughs> you know like the wit is still there it's right there ready to go he's got a quip that's why we love Tyrion. yeah he's dedicated to the part and so yeah. and for the chat like yes uh as i said illyrio a man who falls to his vices 
uh, used to be used to be a Bravo, but is now really packed on the pounds. Definitely a fan of food and drink and women. Um, he's he he is he is like a a, a Pentoshi Robert Baratheon. And so when trying to think of a voice for him, my immediate thought was Hedonism Bot from Futurama, which is the voice I have given him. So any any servant that comes, if I'm sure they will come up. Any servant, I'm just gonna call Jumbi the way that Arya Hotaz axe became Sasha. I just invent lore to already put into George's lore just to give it more whimsy. I, I think 80% of the chat is with you, Tim. We're following you. I was gonna I was gonna mention Illyrio's symbolism though. He's got a forked beard. That's like a trident beard. It could be like a sort of a devil symbol. Mm -hmm. um it makes you think of forked lightning as well and then he's a rotting sea cow so what's that about um i just those are all to me that's like moon symbolism yeah like a piece of moon media you know the moon the, the bovine symbolism of the moon is pretty common well it could be um so sea cows Manatees and and dugongs, uh, were what most sail. The belief that sailors were when they saw mermaids is what they were probably referring to. Manatees and sea cows and Illyrio, uh, especially when because I mean I'm I'm putting on an act, but Illyrio does have sort of a sing song voice when he speaks, but he's also a big liar. And we know that like mermaids, when we think of the other mermaids, like Selkies and the Sirens, the Siren song. So him being like a sea cow, especially with Varys, who also has mer merman symbolism, especially in the free cities, mm. is, is like more of this, this uh, siren and Selkie talk. I think this is akin to Peter Baelish's Merlin King symbolism, where he's stealing Sansa and escorting her through the sea to the to a different realm. Mm -hmm. um so he's kind of like a psychopomp figure in that sense uh that could make sense yeah so where are we here thirsty filthy read that i could throw him oh the fat man that's you yeah the fat man made good on the prop hey hurtful <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Tyrion's modesty no sooner did Tyrion lower himself into the hot water and close his eyes than he was fast asleep he wore, he woke naked on a goose down feather bed so soft it felt as if he had been swallowed by a cloud. His tongue was growing hair and his throat was raw, but his cock was as hard as an iron bar. He rolled from the bed, found a chamber pot and commenced to filling it with a groan of pleasure. The room was dim. That's actually hard to do. I'm not going to get into the technical mechanics of that, <laughs> but the room was dim. There was bars of yellow sunlight showing between the slats of the shutters Tyrion shook the last drops off. Again, George, very descriptive. Waddled over, uh, waddled over the patterned mirrorish carpets as soft as new spring grass. Awkwardly, he climbed the window seat and flung the shutters open to see where Varys and the gods had sent him. Beneath his window, six cherry trees stood sentinel around a marble pool, their slender branches bare and brown. Okay, so... Again, we're always looking for our weirwood substitutes. And anytime we have trees being described as sentinels or soldiers, that's where that's where we are. So yeah, the chair so the cherry trees. Uh, a naked boy stood on the water, poised to duel with a bravo's blade in hand. He was lithe and handsome, no older than 16, with straight blonde hair that brushed his shoulders. So lifelike did he seem that it took the dwarf a long moment to realize he was made of painted marble though his sword shimmered like true steel. So an ode to Illyrio's narcissism here, he had a statue, he commissioned a statue of himself when he was a young man. I just want to point out, this sounds like six others in Waymar Royce a lot with mm -hmm. these six sentinels, because the others are tree-like and they are watchers as well. So yeah, and usually the sentinel trees get cloaked in, snowy cloaks and become others in general the sentinel trees might always be others in fact I, i'd have to go and make a list but that is what i remember is that they usually end up wearing snowy cloaks and becoming others yeah. so the idea of six of them here and then we've got one sword fighter in the middle the, the same age as waymar and john who are sort of paralleled in that scene 
Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, especially to if the six others come back when John is resurrected. So six others standing around a lithe and handsome youth with straight blonde hair. If John comes back and his hair lightens mm. to, a, to a white shade. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. So, yeah, because the last time we talked about John, I had mentioned the idea of the eye of his body being missing from the ice cells, uh, a John Jesus parallel where they Melisandre pre prepares to resurrect him. They go to the ice cells. The body is missing. It's like Jesus being no longer being in the cave because he's been body snatched by the others. So for John to be first resurrected by the others, if it is a group of six other when he when he comes to, if it's a group of six others standing around him, then we'll know. Yeah, and this whole thing is made of marble. The marble is, that is the icy rock. It's white, frequently veined with blue, like the others have blue blood, like in the Eerie. So when it says a marble pool, I'm assuming the marble is like the container of the pool. The water is water, no doubt. But mm. the language makes it sound like the pool itself is marble, which would be an icy pond. And that, of course, is signature other symbolism their voices are like the cracking of the ice on a winter lake. Uh, there's the whole symbolism of Dante's Inferno where Lucifer is trapped in a frozen pond in the ninth circle of hell that George seems to be riffing on. And we've seen over and over going through an icy pond is language for other transformation. Both John and Vermeer, when they die, it's like the shock of going through at the ice on an icy pond. And that's because they're both doing frozen death transformation. So there's no doubt then that these six sentinel trees around the marble pool with a marble youth fighting. Yeah, this is all about the others making John their leader. Um, potentially, this could echo John's, the theft of John's body, like you're saying. That's good stuff. And then, of course, it picks up. Across the pool stood a brick wall, 12 feet high, with iron spikes along its top. Mm -hmm. So we're like right across the wall here somewhere, north of the wall. And the others are resurrecting John. That's what we're looking at. Yeah. Beyond that was a city. A sea of tiled rooftops crowded close around a bay. He saw square brick towers, a great red temple, a distant manse upon a hill. In the far distance, sunlight shimmered off deep water. Fishing boats were moving across the bay, their sails rippling in the wind. And he could see the mass of larger ships poking up along the shore. Surely one is bound for Dorne or Eastwatch by the sea. He had no means to pay passage, though, nor was he made to pull an oar. I suppose I could sign on as a cabin boy and earn my way by letting the crew bugger me up and down the narrow sea. It's always an option. <laughs> I do want to point out real quick, too. It just it jogged my memory when you with the, the marble talk. Um, it also is possibly another king in yellow reference uh because illyrio with his blonde hair and his yellow fork beard uh in the king in yellow which is not a full story but a series of short story it's an anthology tale a series of short stories one of them is called the mask and we talked about mask slipping and that story centers around a sculptor who has who is able to turn organic objects into marble through a machine he creates. And so here we have a a light, a very lifelike marble statue of Illyrio as a young man. So this could be an uh rep, George giving a nod, uh tip of the hat to that particular King in Yellow story. It also might be meant to think us like the last hero become became the Knights King or something like that. You know? Mm -hmm. Um but that's the thing, like <laughs> George loves to we because he'll he weaves in his own inner lore that he has created, but then also weaves in his outside influences, and that's what makes reading the story such a treat is picking out all of the Easter eggs. So Bud Raven's asking about Lem Lemon Cloak and King and Yellow symbolism. If you recall, Bud <laughs> Raven, Lem Lemon Cloak starts wearing the hound's helm, which is a very much a devil symbol. That's a hellhound symbol. And it's also like a skin changing thing because he's taking someone's identity and wearing it. So that's all very Azor high, like um, stealing someone's, you know, taking on a skin changer power, stealing identity, becoming a hellhound or a devil figure um, that kind of fits. So I bet if you go look at the, 
the lines, it might it might work. Yeah. And uh, yeah. no, te- I have not seen Legion, but uh, and someone asked me about if I'd seen a 2024 Deep Ones movie. I've seen a couple movies based off of Lovecraft, but not that particular one. I got just like my list of things to read keeps growing. My list of movies to watch keeps growing, but I'll I'll have to look into it. And yeah, I want to do a. I got to look more into Lem Lemon Clo because I'm sure there's some King and Yellow symbolism. I just got to. He's a lawn myth, yeah. right? So yeah, that I definitely that he is Rhaegar so his Squire. Sigil, Richard his sigil, his sigil, his sigil is the skulls and and kisses, yeah. right? Oh yeah, yeah. There's definitely King and Yellow symbolism is definitely in the lawn myth sigil, and uh, it's also in the Vance in the Vance sigils. Uh, there's well, there's there's two Vance families, but one of them has has uh the black dragon with the yellow sun that is total king with the yellow and the yellow sun has a face it is total king in yellow uh mm-hmm. stuff that i got like i gotta do a deeper dive on yeah and this is again i'll just point out the brilliance of george's writing like there's so many layers and lenses and angles that you can find in the story that are hidden until you see them like if you don't think about the king in yellow then there's not it's fine. The story is still great, but if you do happen to know it and Mm -hmm. you start looking at all the characters that are like overwhelmingly yellow and then comparing them and you're like, wait a minute, there is something in common here. Like this is all commentary (laughs) on one archetype. So yeah, Yeah. good stuff. And a lot of it is in the sigils and the minor characters because the sit. The, it's particularly the sigils of small houses and minor characters, because those things could be anything. Mm-hmm. The sigil for House Lawnmouth could be any damn thing. It doesn't matter. It'll just go right by our ears. They're blue beetles, seven clouds on a green field, whatever. There's Who cares? It's just yeah. some bit character. But once you lock into the scene and you start putting the symbols together, you see how he's using the descriptions of minor characters and minor houses to create shapes, to paint colors, to put skulls and kisses in the middle of a sentence. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just, um, it's more evidence that some, I've gotten a lot of new people to the channel recently, Tim. And so I've gotten a few of the, those comments that are like, or maybe, you know, you're hallucinating all of this and George is just writing a story and all that. And it's just like, yeah. Um, My favorite one was when we read the mystery night, when, when, Damon Blackfire Jr. says, like, Veer, Veerwell, Sunderland, uh, Smallwood, go go fetch Glendon Ball. And I real and I was like, a black dragon just told a squisher, a wyvern, and a tiny tree person to go grab him a comet. Like, it's just like... <laughs> Which turns into a three men walked into a bar joke. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, totally. <laughs> No, the the sigils tell a story all their own, and so do and and the food porn does as well. <laughs> so he he wondered where he was. Even the air smells different here. Strange spices scented the chilly autumn wind, and he could hear faint cries drifting over the wall from the streets beyond. It sounded something like Valyrian, but he did not recognize more than one word in five. Not Bravos, he concluded, nor Tyrosh. Those bare branches and the chill in the air argued against Lise and Mir and Volantis as well. When he heard the door opening behind him, Tyrion turned to confront his fast, fat host. This is Pentos, yes? Just so. Where else? Pentos. Well, it was not King's Landing. That much could be said for it. Where do whores go? He heard himself ask. Whores are found in brothels here, as in Westeros. You will have no need of such, my little friend. Choose from amongst my serving women. None will dare refuse you. Slaves? The dwarf asked pointedly. The fat man stroked one of the prongs of his oiled yellow beard, a gesture Tyrion found remarkably obscene. (laughs) Slavery is forbidden in Pentos. By the terms of the treaty the Bravosi imposed on us a hundred years ago. Still... They will not refuse you. Okay, so (laughs) strong vibes of, like, the Old South here. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we can't have slavery's outlawed, you know, because of the terms the North imposed on us 100 years ago Mm -hmm. in the War of Northern Aggression. And it's like, 
And and it's like we get an ironborn vibe through that. Like they're not slaves, they're thralls. They're not slaves, they're indentured servants. It's like tomato, tomato. You know what you know what they are. You and I both know what they are, but this is like a don't ask, don't tell situation. Yeah, yeah. I just the language here, this is definitely George riffing on the old south holdout types. And those are they're still around too, man. Let me tell you. Um mm -hmm. let me tell you what. <laughs> And that war is not over minus some people in the south that is that is for damn sure south will rise again and that is another one of the things that really shows you too that Varys is full of shit when it comes to his whole team small folk thing because he wants to put his pet project king on and Fagon a typical teenager nothing to say that he's a wretch he has his moments like when he flips the table when him and Tyrion plays the boss but the the idea that Varys presents in the in the uh not the what's the the epilogue of the of dance is that you know he's a kid who's been raised to believe he thinks that he should be king. But the thing is, is like if you were looking for a good kid to mold, you got one in Tommen. We saw like again, I'm I allude yeah. back to your Cersei stream. Yeah. I'm actually I'm surprised your Cersei stream is fitting so is well, maybe I shouldn't be too surprised it's fitting so well here. But Tommen's a good kid. He cry, you know, he cry, he's made to feel bad for crying at his grandfather's funeral. He has little kid tendencies, like when he says he wants to ban beats and things like that. But for the most part, he's a good kid, a sweet kid, empathetic, and he's someone who's willing to learn. Uh, Varys could very much he's he's moldable and he's not Joffrey. Uh, Varys could have good work with Tommen, but it's not his pet project therefore he has to throw it away and he's willing but the in the other side of that is and to get to his pet project he is working with people like Illyrio someone who may not be as open with it as the guys in slavers bay but for all intents and purposes is a slaver but he is the one that is bankrolling this whole operation so yeah, Var Varys is willing. To, like, I mean, I guess like you could say like, well, you know, you got you got to work with unsavory people to get things done, and that is a real political thing. Sometimes you have you have to grease the palms of very seedy individuals so that you can get to the greater good. But it does smack you in the face when you know that like Varys could just as easily try and be a, a good council, just just keep his role in the small council and just try and steer Tom in his own way. But he won't. He won't because it's not his pet project. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that exposes his hypocrisy, I feel like. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, so, but now my little friend must excuse me. I have the honor to be a magister of this great city, and the prince has summoned us to session. He smiled, showing a mouthful of crooked yellow teeth. Explore the mats and grounds as you like, but on no account stray beyond the walls. It is best that no man knows that you were here. Were? Have I gone somewhere? Time enough to speak of that this evening, my little friend. And I shall eat and drink and make great plans, yes. Yes, my fat friend, Tyrion replied. He thinks to use me for his profit. It was all profit with the merchant princes of the free cities. Spice soldiers and cheese lords. Oh, spice soldiers and cheese lords. His father called them with contempt. Should a day ever dawn when Illyrio Mopatis saw more profit in a dead dwarf than a live one, Tyrion would find himself packed in another wine cask by dusk. He would be well if I was gone before that day arrives. That it would arrive, he did not doubt. Cersei was not like to forget him, and even Jamie might be vexed to find a quarrel in father's belly. So this is the difference between Tyrion mm -hmm. and other characters who are more gullible. Well, Tyrion is a little gullible with Taisha, but other characters that are less self-aware, more naive or whatever, like Tyrion is right away thinking about the fact that he can't trust Illyrio and he's assessing mm -hmm. him and stuff like that. So he's not totally lost, you know? And I really do feel like the political machinations is something that Tyrion enjoys, and mm -hmm. is one of the things that sort of brings him back to caring about stuff. Yeah. Tyrion, for lack of a better term, Tyrion likes swimming in the swamp. He really, he really does. Um, when it comes to things of his own personal 
uh, personal well-being. That's that's where he falters, like you said, with Taisha, his own personal comfort and 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 security. But outside of that, when he's just looking at the political machinations separate from himself, he's very, very good at it. And he knows not to trust Illyrio. And then I also want to point out too, the prince has summoned us. Well, for those who may be unaware, but with the way Pentos runs is there is a prince of Pentos, but he's more of a figurehead. He's very much a the puppet prince of Pentos, as George would probably say with his alliteration. <laughs> um, the the tattered prince who we met who we've talked about in the if we if you go check out the Quentin stream that Dave and I did where we read Quentin chapters, uh Tattered Prince pops up a lot. He was someone who was originally going to be a prince of Pentos, um, because when the prince, the prince of Pentos, his it's like a, a role of you get to do whatever you want, you live like a king, you get to have sex with any woman you want, you treat it like a rock star. But as soon as things go bad, they kill you. And Tatters even says it's like they hadn't even cleaned the blood off the pavement from the last prince when they summoned when they elected him to be the next prince of Pentos. So just the idea that the prince has called Illyrio is like, no, you more than you guys more than likely called him. The magisters are the ones really running the show. The prince of Pentos is just just a figurehead until until you have until there's a big enough problem, then they blame it on him and kill him. So it's the prince of Pentos gets like a few good day. They're really good days that he gets, but then they just come to a crashing end for him. You definitely don't blame Tatters, at least for like trying to opt out of that shit. <laughs> right. So uh, a light wind was riffling the waters of the pool below, all around the naked swordsman. Oh, crap. I lost my place. Like, see how. All right, my bad. Technical difficulties. A light wind was riffling the water all around the naked swordsman. It reminded him of how Taisha would riffle her hair during the rifle his hair during the false spring of their marriage, before he helped his father's guardsmen rape her. He okay, so yeah, I guess I'm sorry, late, but this is our trigger warning because that does happen in this chapter. He had been thinking of those guardsmen during his flight, trying to recall how many there had been. You would think he might remember that, but no. A dozen, a score, a hundred, he could not say. They had all been grown men, tall and strong, though all men were tall to a dwarf of 13 years. Taisha knew their number. Each of them had given her a silver stag, so she would only need to count the coins. A silver for each and a gold for me. His father had insisted that he pay her too. A Lannister always pays his debts. Wherever whores go, he heard Lord Tywin say once more, and once more, the bowstring thrummed. So let's just break down. I just have to, we just have to hit Tywin on this. Um, mm -hmm. Not only is Tywin a hypocrite, because he, in fact, is not above paying sex workers for service. Um, he turned a woman, a third, sorry, a 13-year-old girl mm -hmm. into obviously an incredible victim, but basically he's trying to show Tyrion all women are really whores. That's what, that's the message here. He's taking an innocent girl and for, and pay. I struggle with the language to describe this mm -hmm. thing, but you see what I'm, what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, Tywin, like his disrespect for women is so deep and broad sweeping that like, he sees them all as transactions. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, that's kind of what the lesson that he's trying to sear into Tyrion's mind here is like, there's no such thing as love. None of them really love you. They're all just, you know, whores. Yeah. And, and what so it's, it's really awful. Mm -hmm. And it is when we think of Tyrion as a villain, like that's part of his origin story. A lot of it is Tywin's malevolence. Um, and adding the extra, um, adding the extra layer of like 
no, she was in fact an innocent girl who really did love you. It's just, oh man. Yeah. It's possibly the most awful thing that George has like written or yeah. thought of. Like, and what, Ty, what Tywin is doing is he's projecting his father onto Tyrion. Uh, Tywin, not, not to make any excuses for Tywin. Uh, but Tywin, um, he has, he has to go through his, his younger days where he's suffering the follies of his father, uh, just scratching and clawing to get the Lannister name back to the, back to the level of prominence that he believes that it should have, that he believes suffered under his father and his father at the end of his life takes a commoner woman into his bed. One who Tywin sees only as a whore. So he is taking that anger that he has towards his father, right? placing it now on his son, looking at Tyrion, and, and it's like, I ain't doing this shit again with you. But that is, you know, that is misplaced anger. And he already has anger because he sees Tyrion as folly in and of himself. He's a dwarf. Um, in Tywin's eyes, he killed his wife. He killed the greatest love of his life, even though that's, you know, Death through childbirth was common in this area. In this era, it's not Ty, it's not Tyrion's mm. fault. But Tywin is projecting all of this misplaced anger onto Tyrion for think for things that he has done and imagined things that he has done, and just things that Tywin relates back to other people who have disappointed him and placing it all on Tyrion. And then, as far as Joanna, um, it's not uncommon for people who are bigoted against a gender or a race or something like that to take, to make one exception or to make a few exceptions and put them on the pedestal and say, well, these are the good ones. Mm -hmm. You know, Joanna's not a whore, but all other women are, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is consistent with that sort of uh, prejudice and bigotry. So, yeah. Yeah. And people, yeah, he's, I look, I, in my Ramsey won the, no, Euron won the villain's tourney. Mm. But honestly, once you got down to a certain level with people like Littlefinger, Tywin, Ramsey, and uh and uh Euron, it's like how do you even distinguish? They're just different kinds of overwhelmingly malevolent evil. Uh so yeah, you can see why Tywin is is such a bad person. Yeah. Anyway. Um. So another super chat came in from Ellie Ferry. Uh, thoughts on whom? Thoughts on whom Arya serves at the House of Black and White? Are you talking about the the kindly man? Thoughts on whom Arya serves? Um, yeah, we needed some ex elaboration on that one. Yeah, but thank you for the super chat, though. Uh, Real quick, somebody's mentioning. Um, let's see, what did they say? This isn't a story about good people. I would disagree there. It's a story about good people trying to do to stand up for what is right in it, you know, against overwhelming odds. So George talks about, I mean, he has the others, obviously, but the others aren't really involved in most people's stories. They're not chasing people, they're only north of the wall. So George has filled every single main character's story with monsters of this sort, Jano Slint, Vargo Hote, the Kingsguard who brings Sansa to be beat, you know, or beat Sansa at Joffrey's command, um, Marillion, the, the abuser. Like, there are monsters in every corner of the world, and they are human monsters. And that is something that George kind of feels strongly about. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked, Tim, a lot about George's themes and what's the message of this or that. I really think that it all starts with George trying to write realistically. And every writer is trying to do this in some extent. You're trying to create a whole world and fill it with all different kinds of people and then have them interact and all do things. So you have to be able to plausibly recreate the way that people realistically behave. And when you've got a fantasy world with fantasy elements, it's just a matter of saying, well, what would people do if they had glass candles? What would people do if... Yeah chopping people's balls off could sometimes give you sorcerous power. What would people do if you could ride dragons and what would that look like? So with George, I really feel like he's just trying to say like, why are there so, why is there so much violence against women? Because it's, 
because there is. Why are these why are there these bad people that do this to women and children and stuff? Because people do that. And so if you write a story and you don't have those things in there, then it's kind of like, well, why are you censoring that out of the world when that does exist? Slavery exists. And honestly, there's nothing in Ice and Fire more horrible than real history. Real history is full of stuff that is just would be too awful to even put in a fictional story almost. Mm. Steven Erickson has tried with this Malison series. There are some mass atrocities in, in that series, you know, that are just tough, tough to read. Um, and th this is this Taisha stuff is mm. like that. Um, yeah. And I think what George is trying to do is it's not like a nihilistic thing where it's like, oh, everyone's just evil. The main characters are standing up against this Sam, Davos. Danny, Tyrion, or not Tyrion, uh, John, Brienne, like standing against doing what is right at great cost. That is what Martin, you know, that's Martin's heroism. That's what he loves to write about. He fills the world with monsters and then he shows you Brienne standing up to them, even at great cost. Sorry, Tim, I, I monologued, but I, I feel strongly about this stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the mysterious people who served serious people she served in the house of black and white it only tells a description of them one is fat one has a blue beard and one is squinting oh uh, so were those like customers at the house of black well and those are the act those are the different acolytes that come to meet those are the other faceless men and they mm -hmm. all get interesting descriptions are we supposed to figure out who any of those people are i've never thought so i've always thought those are just they need descriptions, you know, but I don't know. Maybe they're supposed to be different people. Is are is, are you wondering if like are you trying to connect them to somebody in this chapter? What's the link to what we're talking about here? I'm confused. Right, I don't well, think Illyria is a faceless man. If that was the question, no, no, um. I mean, if anything, Illyrio is someone that someone would want the faceless men to take care of. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we can go back to the story. So the magister had invited him to explore the mats. He found clean clothes in a cedar chest inlaid with lapis and mother of pearl. The clothes had been made for a small boy, he realized as he struggled into them. The fabrics were rich enough, if a little musty, but the cut was too long in the legs and too short in the arms, with a collar that would have turned his face as black as Joffrey's had he somehow contrived to get it fastened. Moths had been at them, too. At least they do not stink of vomit. All right, so this is... When we start thinking about Illyrio's role in the Blackfire plot and whether or not... Not just whether or not Fagon is a Blackfire, but whether he has any kind of more meaningful connection to Illyrio. This becomes one of the big ones because it's not just is Fagon a Blackfire, it's also is he Illyrio's son? Because in the next Tyrion chapter when when Illyrio says the black the male Blackfire line has died has died out, you get the sense of like okay, that's very specific. That's that implies you're le you're letting on that the female line continued. And Illyrio's second wife, who he picks up in a Lysini pillow house, has some Targaryen feature. She has silver blonde hair and very, very dark blue eyes to the point that they're almost purple. So the fact that there are children's clothing here in a house, in a giant manse where there's no little kid running around makes it very, very suspect. And then it hammers home when we get to the second chapter that... Illyrio talks about bringing him candy ginger. He talks that he knows it's the boy's favorite treat. And when the baggage train leaves and Tyrion sees Illyrio in the distance, he says the cheese man, the cheesemonger looks small. You get it, it brings the sense of this is this is more than just him wanting to see the kid. This is this seems like a father who very much misses his son. I was about to say, Fagon is definitely Illyrio's son. I've not, I don't know how that's not the case. I mean, that's kind of the whole mm -hmm. centerpiece of the Fagon Blackfire theory is that he is Illyrio's son. So, yeah. And that's, that's the whole point. That's the other point of this statue is to show mm -hmm. us that 
a young Illyrio would remind us of Fagon. Yeah. And that's why I call him Big Papa Mopatis. I love it when you call me Big Pop. But, uh, but yeah, I, do, I, do, I that's why I like... I think Illyrio is one of the one of the more interesting side characters that we get, and that's another reason why I want to explore this idea. And also, for those who don't know, before I started streaming, when I was just writing essays, uh, my first big one was uh, on Fagon. Fagon, a parallel of kings, princes, and pretenders. And I note the the Blackfire connections as long as well as the Targaryen connections. And Illyrio fits in there too because Illyrio is Pentoshi. And I reflect it back to Jaehaerys, the conciliator. Uh, his master of coin was a Pentoshi man by the name of Rago Draws. He was called the Lord of Air. He was a Pentoshi who raised himself up from nothing to become the richest man of Pentos, but he was scorned by the aristocracy. So he looked for a place in Westeros. Um, and he becomes the master of coin. Well, Illyrio, when he is questioned on why he was trying to help Viserys, he drops that Viserys was going to make him his master of coin. Um, and that would have been a very powerful position. But it also stands to reason that that might also be an option with Fagon. Well, again, Illyrio, who was Illyria? He was a man who came from nothing. He was a sellsword, a Pentoshi Bravo, but he raised himself up to become what is now the richest man in Pentos. But when he takes his second wife, who is a Lyce who was he found in a Lycini uh, se sex house, he is scorned by the aristocracy. It is said after that the the uh, the the mansions of the of the prince were were closed to him, which also makes it another thing that's suspect to say that the prince has summoned him because he says himself, like, no, I I, I lost my right to be at the prince's manse when when I took this. Uh, sex worker for my second wife. So he is scorned by the Pentoshi aristocracy, just in the same way that Rago draws is. So like there becomes your parallels here. So to add him also as a father, it also gives more reason as to why exact, why is this man bankrolling this whole affair? If this is Varys's project, and this has got to go, this goes beyond the terms of just this being like, Oh, Illyrio and Varys are best friends and he's just trying to help his best friend with something. I'm like, that's, that's nice. But to, to, to be, to put this much financial stake into your best friend's plans, like what you do, you, you have to be getting something personal out of it. Well, yeah. And he talks about contracts, you know, for money mm -hmm. and for blood. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. also points to a blood tie. Oh yeah, we're we're gonna do the second Tyrion chapter. That's for damn sure. And I know you said you want to do his his chapters on the Roy and on your channel. And that starts at Tyrion three. I'm but glad yeah. we did this on your channel. You're definitely getting more out of this chapter than I would have. <laughs> that's good. That's because I'm the I'm the treacherous Blackfire supporter. <laughs> Let no man deny it. <laughs> also, real real quick, um, we haven't gotten the description of these clothes yet. The colors, but the chest is inlaid with lapis and mother of pearl. Lapis is, of course, blue. Mother of pearl is white, and that is specifically a moon symbol. So this is an ice moon decorated chest that he is dressing himself in. And clothes are always used to show, you know, things like transformation, skin changing, yeah. taking on a new role or identity. So we'll see what they say. Obviously, these are children's clothes, and he's a dwarf. So the arms and legs aren't the quite ratio, um, but yeah, let's see. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, those gemstone. Oh, we will get there. I believe it. I think I'm pretty sure it's in this chapter. The dinner. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Tyrion comments on Illyrio's fat fingers and all his rings. So we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. So, do you want to pick it up, Tyrion? Uh, give me a second. I need to run to the restroom. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'll I'll just continue talking. Uh, I'll continue reading. Tyrion began his explorations with the kitchen, where two fat women and a pot boy watched him warily as he helped himself to cheese, bread, and figs. Good morrow to you, fair ladies, he said with a bow. Do you know where whores go? When they did not respond, he repeated the question in High Valyrian, though he had to say courtesan in place of whore. The younger, fatter cook gave him a shrug that time. All right, so when we go back to like the ship boy, too. Um, it, it, one, it, first you wonder like, are they just ignoring him or is this a language barrier? 
but here he is speaking in high Valyrian and they still are refusing to answer him, which probably means that they've been given orders by Illyrio of don't talk to him. But unfortunately for Illyrio, he's going to be the one who has diarrhea of the mouth and lets too much slip. He wondered what they would do if he took them by the hand and dragged them to his bedchamber. None will dare refuse you, Illyrio claimed, but somehow Tyrion did not think he meant these two. But still, this is showing Tyrion having these darker thoughts of, you know, I could. I'm not going to, but I could. It's a lot of Dennis and it's always sunny vibes. The younger woman was old enough to be his mother, and the older was likely her mother. Both were near as fat as Illyrio, with teats that were larger than his head. I could smother myself in flesh. That's a way to go. <laughs> there were worse ways to die, the way his lord father had died for one. I should have made him shit a little gold before expiring. Lord Tywin might have been stingy with his approval and affection, but he had always been open-handed when it came to coin. The only thing more pitiful than a dwarf without a nose is a dwarf without a nose who has no gold. <laughs> That's funny. Did, did you have something you wanted to add in? No, I just wanted to laugh. I realized I wasn't muted, though. Sorry if you heard some coughing in the background. <laughs> so Tyrion left the fat women to their loaves and kettles and went in search of the cellar where, where Illyrio had decanted him the night before. It was not. <laughs> that's another one. Lirio had decanted him. Like, that's. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> we'll give it a little shake. Mm, yes. Mm, this is a fine dwarf. Yes. <laughs> I'll pick it up if you want to take a break here. Oh, sure. Um, it was not hard to find the cellar. There was enough wine there to keep him drunk for a hundred years. Sweet reds from the Reach and sour reds from Dorne. Pale Pantoshi Ambers, the green nectar of Mir. Three score casks of Arbor Gold. Even wines from the fabled East, from Karth and Yi Ti and a shy by the shadow. Did you have something about a shy wines? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so this one, this line is all, anytime we get a line from a shy, but this one has always stuck out to me. Because now... It's 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 wrong to say that nothing grows in a shy. The line is very little grows in a shy. So so some some things grow there, not much. Ghost grass Ghost and grass. the strange leaf that makes the strangler grows mm -hmm. there. Those are yeah. two things we know of. But this idea, well, a wine from a shy. So if very little grows there, right? It seems like you you probably wouldn't expect someone to have like a vineyard out there. There's no a shy running running a winery out there yeah grapes like mm -hmm. people you don't understand the reason why good wine comes from france and italy and california and only a couple of places like chile mm -hmm. it's very picky like you can grow the best wine in the best climates and you can't really grow wine that's as good in a in an inferior climate you can grow a different kind of grape or pretty good wine but if you're really trying to make the best wine, you have to seek out the climate. You want to build on, you want to put your uh, vineyards on sloped ground so you have good drainage. There are all these things that go into it. Like I have friends in Napa. I've visited the vineyards and they've talked a little bit about picking the land and you grow different grapes on different parts of the hill because of the drainage. I mean, they've really got this stuff dialed in. So, that you're right. There are not vineyards anywhere in the Shadowlands. That there, that is not mm. a possibility. So, what could they be doing? Are the vineyards in Ulthos, and they are just um, making it in a shy, or what? What is what's going on there? Is it sorcery wine? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's what got me thinking on this. So, so two things that I came, that I that I pon when I was pondering on this that I came to the conclusion. If it's was. just blood, that wouldn't be wine. That would just be <laughs> bottled blood. But go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, one is like um, 
could be a hippocrass where they take another a wine that's already been made but then just add one extra ingredient and that is really like the seedier side of capitalism right is 95 percent of the work when you're making a product 95 percent of the work could be made, done in china or bangladesh but as long as one component is done in the united states you can slap a made in america sticker on it three so, drops from the river ash gives it that little phosphorescent gleam yeah but then then the other one was that phosphorescent gleam what would you have that in a liquor and that made me think of absinthe and this is where i taught where i mentioned i mentioned to you the myth of the green fairy so absinthe um is brewed with a plant called wormwood and the idea that absinthe makes you hallucinate is a myth and for the myth of the green fairy, anyone who's seen Euro Trip, you might know what I'm talking about. When they go to Eastern Europe, Bratislava, uh, they drink absinthe and then they and they hallucinate a green fairy flying around. And that is a myth, and it's made popular by Van Gogh and some other bohemian artists back in the day who swore that absinthe was making them trip. More than likely, but... Keep in mind, this is Van Gogh and Bohemian artists, so chances are they were ingesting some other stuff. So can't really attribute it to the, if they were tripping, if they were having any kind of hallucinogenic visions. Might not it, have it, so the drug math was not as developed then. Um, here it's in the Bay Area in the year of our Lord 2024. The drug math is very advanced. People know how to blend these things, but um, not me. I just, mm -hmm. I stick to the praising Garth and that's it. But yeah, they um back in these times they were they were just they were not sure of uh you know what does what and how much of one thing or the other they were just like this stuff makes some neat effects. <laughs> yeah, but the other thing so the other thing that I have about absinthe is like I said it's brewed with wormwood. Now wormwood is not a tree it's it's more like a weed and it's actually an invasive weed just as ghost grass is an invasive plant. And we've talked about how George always, for places that don't have weirwoods, George will use these substitutes because it seems like, I know there are people who think that like ghost grass is just means weirwoods. Uh, I, really? I, I, I differ. Think, no, no, that's bad. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe that because we know that weirwoods are actually kind of stingy in where they grow. They can't grow in the iron islands where their soil is too loose they don't grow in dorn where it's sandy they don't grow in the veil they tried transplanting weirwoods to the veil so the idea that weirwoods would take root in a place as corrupted as a shy no 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 but, the ghost hold on hold on mm -hmm. i'm getting my hammer out ghost mm -hmm. grass has nothing in common with weirwoods there's no connection none ghost yeah, grass is, is a type of grass that looks like a field of dawn sword blades and it looks they glow with the spirits of the damned they are a symbolism construction mm -hmm. it, it as far as what it is physically it's a it's a weird mutated form of grass but it doesn't they're not trees they're not tree yeah. shapes the weirwoods don't grow straight and slender like blades they're all twisted and gnarly there's there's nothing in common there and not everything has to be a weirwood like the shade of the evening trees might already be weirwoods like and the weirwoods themselves seem to be changed because they used to be green. So we've got three different trees and we have the goldenwood trees on the summer aisles that are called talking trees and they have carvings in them too. So there might be a lot of magic trees, but the ghost grass, the ghost grass, like it's sending us symbolic messages. Okay. Because and it also ties to the Dothraki prophecy of the ghost grass spreading through the world. Okay, so it, there's a prophecy. Uh, well, there's two prophecies that the Dothraki have. One is the stallion who mounts the world, and one is this thing that Jor refers to that when the world ends, ghost grass, you know, will cover the world and kill all life on earth. But then that actually sounds a lot like the prop, the uh, prophecy of the stallion who says that all of the his the his horde will have blades like shining razor grass and they will cover the world and kill everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's this prophecy of these shining blades covering the world and killing everyone. Um, and when we go look at the ghost grass, they look like dawn blades. They are pale as milk glass and they glow with the spirits of the damned. Now, the others are spirits of the damned and they have glowing blades. They glow, um, they're, they're like a crystal, 
and they're pale, uh, you know, they glow, uh, they're alive with moonlight, just as dawn is alive with light. So it, there are, of course, theories that tie dawn to the others and the idea of ice sorcery. It's kind of off the beaten path, but that's what the ghost grass is talking about. It's showing you that the others, like, why do we find the ghost grass in a shy where Azor High comes from? in its post-transformed state because Azor Ahai created the others. Like they are his children with Night's Queen. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why they are there. That puzzled me for a long time, but that's the message. It's like a whole field of Dawn Swords or a field of others. And they are prophesied to cover the world and kill everyone. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, that is Azor Ahai giving birth to the others who want to cover the earth and kill everyone. So that yeah. that's what I make of the ghost grass. Um, yeah. it's mostly like all its entire description is based on symbolism. So I have no idea how someone connected them to the weirwoods. I've never heard that before. I'm just reporting on things that I have seen, but that's why we're, we're debunking that absinthe causes hallucinations. We're debunking uh, that ghost grass is where <laughs> no. ghost grass is a different kind of plant. And like I said, it sounds like an invasive weed that just, overwhelms and overpowers native grasses and takes over. Now, the point I'm getting at with wormwood is, wormwood is the same. It's a weed. It naturally grows in Africa, but has become an invasive species in the United States and New Zealand and Australia, where it kind of grows out of control. The other thing about wormwood is absinthe, when brewed with wormwood, um, wormwood just adds like subtle hints and notes, but the other, but that's in small doses, okay? Wormwood, if ingested in large doses, it can be made into a tea and it, and it can be ingested. But in large doses, it will cause seizures and renal failure. So it is and I, it's something that can be used like in, in little bits can be used as like, oh, this is this is nice. This adds a little flavor, adds a little kick. But in large doses can be poison, just like mushroom. Same thing with mushrooms. Certain types of mushrooms can be very good. I was going to uh, compare that to mushrooms. Yeah. yeah. Someone and, is saying, is it confirmed that virus is actually a eunuch? I'm not that I don't think anyone's lifted up his skirt or whatever and right. checked if that's what you're asking. So I guess, no, we don't know that he's a eunuch. I. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't know anything about him. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that could be that could be a story he made up. Um, I do just want to show this. So this is ju just to show you what wormwood looks like. So you can really get what I'm talking about. Like you can see like it's, it's a green weed, but you see how like it has this white glossiness, mm. almost like a yeah. plant covered in snow. Yeah. So when I was thinking of what could grow out in a shy that they'd be making wines from wormwood seemed like a, a likely candidate and mm. because of how much it seems like ghost grass an invasive species, it's got... Okay. White, that gr it's got the white tints, grows gr green, phosphorescent in the night, the way the river ash would. And, and we've talked about like how I did the house of the worm stream. George loves his wordplay, how worms and serpents become stand-ins for dragons all the time with the worm W O R M worm W Y R M. So no, that makes perfect sense. Azor high wormed his way into the weirwood net. That yeah. is the sinful act Mm -hmm. that defiled everything so that actually yeah. makes perfect sense it could be that the ghost grass is like wormwood mm -hmm. and is serving that role um and the, the ashai wine is made from ghost grass mm -hmm. uh or there is it's actually the yeah, wormwood is growing there yeah that either could make sense so things like wormwood and things like snakewood in that and that's in the in the symbolic sense of dragons that you'd be like okay well that's drag a dragon weed a dragon tree and just given their sinister sounding names if they were to grow in a shy they actually wouldn't seem out of place so so I'm thinking so there's a long long winded way of saying I think the wine that coming from a shy is is an absinthe stand in. And that is, at, but the myth of the green fairy, the absence causes you to trip, is going to make us think of shade of the evening wine. It's going to make us think of weirwood paste. And then in the follow up, where Tyrion does choose his wine, it becomes a mix of both because he chooses a purple drink. So we'll get back to the story on that one. But yeah, that was my whole Dave, you're going to listen to me pop off about the shy wife for a while because. Because once I made this wormwood connection and abs and absinthe, I was, and it all 
it's just like my mind just started whirling and I'm like, I got to tell this to someone. <laughs> well, first of all, I think Maynard Plum is enjoying this conversation wherever he is. And second of all, Kirsty Angel points out that Wormwood is plays a role in a biblical prophecy about a dragon. And I, Kirsty, if you can pull the text on that or just elaborate on what it is, I forget. But I know that you are right that Wormwood is in Revelations and it is a thing. And if it's connected to a dragon, then that uh, could make a lot of sense. I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm not sure. I'm marching south when the others are north. <laughs> <laughs> to go east, you must go west. Or <laughs> so we'll go back to re so. If you want to pick off, so in the end, Tyrion shows a cask of strong wine. If you want to pick it up there. Wrong sin. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Not sure what, um, what we're talking about here. But it, I'll try to catch it if you want to elaborate. Uh, where were we now? In the end, Tyrion chose a cask of strong wine. Ah, uh, yes. Let me go back a page. Uh oh, I went a couple. <laughs> no, I've got no idea where it's um Do you want me to read and you'll try and figure out Yeah, where yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in the end, Tyrion shows a cask of strong wine marked as a private stock of Lord Rumsford Red Wine, the grandfather of the present Lord of the Arbor. The taste of it was languorous and heady on the tongue. The color a purple so dark that it all that it looked almost black in the dim lit cellar. All right. Yep. So purple so dark it's black. And that's we think of one, we think of oily black stone. Two, we think of like Valyrian eyes. So the per, the blues becoming purples, the purples becoming black. It all leads up to here. And it also goes to show that like Tyrion is choosing something closer to home. He's choosing a strong wine and it's purple. And I've talked about like the 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 gray wasted joke that I make all the time here. What happens if you mix shade of the evening wine and weirwood paste? Well, you get purple drink and you get gray wasted. So him drinking a strong purple wine from the arbor, it's like he's having both and he's choosing it from home. And another thing about the arbor wines is Tyrion's been drinking Dornish reds, which are sour. But the Arbor is famous for its Arbor Gold. And some people in the chat may be familiar with the whole lies and Arbor Gold thing. Because uh, Arbor Gold is a sweet wine. It's a dessert wine. It's a honey wine, which makes sense because the honey, the Arbor is part of the Reach. And the honey wine is a river that runs through the Reach. And lies are always associated with Arbor Gold. And... In one way, this is a Fleetwood Mac's reference, a Fleetwood Mac reference. Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. But yeah, it's a honey. Every time Arbor Gold comes up, this honeyed wine has to do with someone lying here. Well, I was noticing that Tyrion took his purple, dark, almost black wine and goes and sits beneath the cherry trees to drink it. So that is essentially. <laughs> drinking shade of the evening in the haunted forest is what mm -hmm. he's doing because when you talk about the almost black wine it's clearly if we're talking about yeah talking about parallels that's shade of the evening and he's going back to that grove of other trees where there's a waymar statue essentially you know <laughs> yeah it's like he, john <laughs> and he's <laughs> drinking there so that's or at least he that's where he wanted to go it, mm -hmm. he, it says as it happened he left by the wrong door and never found the pool he had spied from his window, but it made no matter. The gardens behind the manse were just as pleasant and far more extensive. He wandered through them for a time drinking. That reminds me of Bran wandering through the caves uh, at Hodor's, but I don't know if that's intentional. Um, and then uh, Philosopher King, yeah, Azor Ahai worming his way in the Weirwood is done through the killing of Nissa Nissa and probably other green men. So that's all the same sin. I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Uh, so the garden's more extensive. He wandered through them drinking. The walls would have shamed any proper castle and the ornamental iron spikes along the top looked strangely naked without heads to adorn them. 
<laughs> Tyrion pictured how his sister's head might look up there with tar and her golden hair and flies buzzing in and out of her mouth. Yes, a little bit of homicidal ideation. Yes, and Jamie must have the spike beside her, he decided. No one must ever come between my brother and my sister. With a rope and a grapnel, he might be able to get over that wall. He had strong arms and he did not weigh much. He should be able to clamber over if he did not impale himself on a spike. I will search for a rope on the morrow, he resolved. Just after I drink a little more. It's been a long trip, you know. No reason to hurry. <laughs> <clears throat> um, he saw three gates during his wanderings. The main entrance with its gatehouse, a postern by the kennels, and a garden gate hidden behind a tangle of pale ivy. The last was chained, the others guarded. The guards were plump, their faces as smooth as baby's bottoms, and every man of them wore a spiked bronze cap. Tyrion knew eunuchs when he saw them. He knew their sort by reputation. They feared nothing and felt no pain, it was said, and were loyal to their masters unto death. I could make use of a good few hundred of mine own, he reflected. A pity I did not think of that before I became bigger. Became a beggar. Okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> I'll pick it up here. He walked along a pillared gallery and through a pointed arc and found himself in a tiled courtyard where a woman was washing clothes at a well. She looked to be his own age with dull red hair and a broad face dotted by freckles. Would you like some wine? He asked her. She looked at him uncertainly. I have no cup for you. We'll have to share. The washerwoman went back to wringling out tunics and hanging them to dry. Tyrion settled on a stone bench with his flagon. Tell me how far should I trust Magister Illyrio? The name made her look up. That far? Chuckling, he crossed his stunted legs and took a drink. I am loath to play whatever part the cheesemonger has in mind for me. Yet how can I refuse him? The gates are guarded. Perhaps you might smuggle me out under your skirts. I'd be so grateful. Why, I'll even wed you. I have two wives already. Why not three? Ah, oh, but where would we live? He gave, this is like as when you're talking to another person, but you're really talking to yourself as as it gets. Well, these are NPCs. They probably don't even speak the common tongue. Mm -hmm. So that's why yeah, the only word she recognized out of everything he said was Illyrio's name. He gave her as pleasant a smile as a man without half a nose could manage. I have a niece in St Sunspear. Did I tell you? I could make rather a lot of mischief in Dorne with Marcella. I could set my niece, niece and nephew at war. Wouldn't that be droll? The washerwoman pinned up one of Illyrio's tunics, large enough to double as a sail. They just really just hammer home how large Illyrio is. I should be ashamed to think such evil thoughts. You're quite right. Better if I sought the wall instead. All crimes are wiped clean when a man joins the night's watch, they say. Though I fear they would not let me keep you, sweetling. No women in the watch, no sweet, freckly wives to warm your bed at night, only cold winds, salted cod, and small beer. Do you think I might stand taller and black, my lady? He filled his cup again. What do you say, north or south? Shall I atone for old sins or make some new ones? So the chat is talking about the three gates in the wall here. I've already pointed out that we might be, this all might be north of the wall symbolism. Um okay. Obviously, there are three castles that have gates through the wall. One of them is the Night Fort. And uh, one of those, there's a garden gate that was locked. That sounds like the Black Gate kind of under the wall, maybe. Um, not sure what the point would be, but it could be that Tyrion is basically serving as an analog for John here. Uh, you know, foreshadowing some John stuff. Or maybe his role helping Danny do some of this stuff, one or the other. Uh, and then there was something else. Well, he's sitting there talking about the wall as well, just to mm -hmm. help us sort of think of it. So, yeah, there could be a running narrative with that. Yeah. And, and, and it opens with him saying, like, the fact that he could feel a chill when he got out and made him know he wasn't in Tyrosh or Lease or, or any of those more southern free cities. He's still, a, he's still on a northern part. Yep. Yep. So the washerwoman gave him one last glance, picked up her basket, and walked away. I cannot seem to hold a wife for very long, Tyrion reflected. Somehow his somehow his flagon had gone dry. Perhaps I should stumble back down to the cellars. The strong wine was making his head spin, though, and the cellar steps were very steep. 
Where do whores go? He asked the wash flapping on the line. Perhaps he should have asked the washerwoman. Not to imply that you're a whore, my dear. Perhaps you know where they go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not implying that you're a prostitute. I'm just saying you look like one. <laughs> Maybe you've met one. <laughs> or better yet, he should have asked his father. Wherever whores go, Lord Tywin said. She loved me. She was a crofter's daughter. She loved me and she wed me. She put her trust in me. The empty flagon slipped from his hand and rolled across the yard. Tyrion pushed himself off the bench and went to fetch it. As he did, he saw some mushrooms growing up from a cracked paving tile. Pale white they were, with speckles and red-ribbed undersides dark as blood. The dwarf snapped one off and sniffed it. Delicious, he thought, and deadly. There were seven of the mushrooms. Okay, so seven deadly mushrooms, seven deadly weirwood substitutes. Seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. And I do just want to share. Uh, so just to give an idea. So when we were talking about mushrooms, edible, edible, poisonous, and hallucinogenic. First, uh, this is the death cat mushroom. So one of the deadliest mushrooms in the world, but doesn't look too different from your common variety mushroom. But then these, this one, another one I have uh, is more, sounds more like what Tyrion is describing. But this is the toadstool called Amanita muscaria, and this is a hallucinogenic toadstool. Yet it seems to fit the description of what Tyrion was describing with these deadly mushrooms speckled red ribbed underside stark as blood so yeah just to give you an idea of like like the the different ways the mushrooms can go and you and it's really hard to tell just just from looking at just from sight alone if you aren't if you don't know exactly what you're looking at how do you know like is this is this gonna kill me is this gonna make a, a great is this gonna be great from a for pasta or is this gonna make me see some shit <laughs> So I, I got something for you on this. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find it. Uh, for well, First of all, let me do a screen share here. Present, share screen. I'm getting faster at this. Share screen. And we're going to do a window. It's going to be this. This is from a book called Children of the Forest. <laughs> it's an animated book. Um, yeah. it's like a children's book of some kind so there's little mushroom people mm -hmm. and they're doing all there's all kinds of fun pictures from it uh, yeah and these same mushrooms and and the psychedelic one i said i showed before they have the exact same pattern as the mushrooms in like super mario that that toad has that that make you grow big and get powers like yeah so i have <laughs> <laughs> I, I superimposed weirwoods on some Amanitas mushrooms one time, and I thought I took a screen grab of it, but I can't find it now. <laughs> so apologies. But yes, the weirwoods look like Amanitas mushrooms, and that is no mistake. Mm -hmm. Like George, George knew exactly what he was doing when he designed the weirwoods in that way and made oh, them I function like mushrooms. I found it. I found oh. it. Okay. Let me just uh, fix my screen share. Mm -hmm. Present. Yeah, oh. and I'm sure Nintendo knew exactly what they were doing when they made Mario's mushrooms look like Amanitas. <laughs> so what's cool is I tried to make the weirwoods and mushrooms on the same scale. So now you can picture... When the when Ned and the people are in the Godswood kneeling in front of the weirwood tree, they're actually like the tiny little children of the forest I just showed you, the little elf people, and they're they're half an inch tall, and they're actually standing under mushrooms. <laughs> like, honey, I shrunk the kids. <laughs> That's what I want you to picture next time you have a Godswood scene. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, back to the story. 
So there were seven of the mushrooms. Perhaps the seven were trying to tell him something. He picked them all, snatched a glove down from the line, wrapped them carefully, and stuffed them down his pocket. The effort made him dizzy, so afterward he crawled back onto the bench, curled up, and shut his eyes. So yeah, so Tyrion knows that these are poisonous mushrooms. Now, for one, that that's a that's just to show how that Tyrion is a learned man, that he knows the difference. But if if you were just some regular guy who was starving and you saw these mushrooms and you didn't know a damn thing about mushrooms, the chances that you might have eaten them are just as high. But Tyrion Tyrion knows he knows this stuff. He knows and he knows poisons and all that. So yeah. Tyrion, Tyrion can know the difference, but not every not everyone knows the difference when it comes to mushrooms, is what I'm getting at. When he woke again, he was back in his bedchamber, drowning in the goose down feather bed once more, with a blonde when a while a blonde girl shook his shoulder. My lord, she said, your bath awaits. Magister Illyrio expects you at table within the hour. Tyrion propped himself up against the pillows, his head in his hands. Do I dream, or do you speak the common tongue? Yes, my lord. I was brought to please the king. Bought, excuse me, I was bought to please the king. She was blue-eyed and fair, young and willowy. I am sure you did. I need a cup of wine. Wait a minute, I was bought to please the king? Mm -hmm. Which king? That's, I'm, I was going to ask the same question. Now, yeah, because we know there's a prince of Pentos. Viserys? Bought to please the could have been Viserys. That's the question: is was it was she bought for Viserys for for when he was staying with Illyrio? Must or have been. Was she bought Must for have Fagon? been. Or yeah, that was my other guess was Fagon, but she's really got some loose lips if she's just referring to King Fagon casually mm -hmm. here. I don't, I don't. It's got to be Viserys. Yeah, but the thing is, like like I said, like. Uh, Illyrio has some loose lips. They he's not he's not coming out directly and saying it, but reading between the lines, you get is like you you start to pick up, especially you know when you when we do these. But they wouldn't tell mm -hmm. the sex worker slave that was bought who Fagon really was. He's not mm -hmm. out as his identity. He's still young Griff. Yeah. So, so she would have said, "I was bought to please young Griff." She's not in on it. So this must be Viserys. It probably was Viserys. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only king it could have been. Okay, bought to please the king. Let's see. I'm sure you did. She poured for him. Magister Illyrio said that I am to scrub your back and make and warm your bed. My name is of no interest to me. Do you know where whores go? She flushed. Whores sell themselves for coin. Or jewels, or gowns, or castles. But where the where do they go? The girl, so that's okay. This is Tyrion repeating Tywin's toxic narrative about women right mm -hmm. all women are actually whores and the women who sell themselves for castles are no different than yeah that's tywin's philosophy the girl could not grasp the question is it a riddle my lord i'm no good at riddles will you tell me the answer she's she's asked it's actually a really good guess it basically is a riddle mm -hmm. so and then, no, he thought, I despise riddles myself. I will tell you nothing. Do me the same favor. Okay, so this is the part where, how much of this do we want to read? Um, um, I don't think he, act, This. I don't think this is the girl that he actually does it to. I think he like, he says something about it and she just like looks at him in disgust and then Tyrion has that like, yep, that's the answer I expected. Yeah, the only part of you that interests me is the part between your legs. He almost said, the words were on his tongue, but somehow it never passed his lips. She is not Shay, the dwarf told himself, only some little fool who thinks I play at riddles. If truth be told, even her cunt did not interest him that much. I must be sick or dead. You mentioned a bath. We must not keep the great cheesemonger waiting. As he bathed, the girl washed his feet, scrubbed his back, and brushed his hair. Afterward, he rubbed sweet-smelling ointment into his calves to ease the aches and dressed him once again in boy's clothing, a musty pair of burgundy breeches, and a blue velvet doublet lined with cloth of gold. Shades of John the Fiddler there. Mm -hmm. Will my lord want me after he is... Uh, will my lord want me after he is eaten? 
she asked as she was lacing up his boots. No, I am done with women. Whores. Yeah, so again, same thing. It's that Tywin philosophy. But hmm. the thing is, like, he's got a... He, he's trying to come to grips with the fact that actually Taisha was not. Mm -hmm. Taisha was just a girl. So he's got some cognitive dissonance swirling around, you know, like he's repeating the words and the mantra of Tywin. But ultimately, I don't think he's going to settle on that because he knows that's not true. And Penny also kind of proves that, mm -hmm. um, you know, later in this book. So. Yeah, I was just, he he's having the thoughts that young men have that allows them to gravitate towards someone like an Andrew Tate, an Andrew Tate type person. These are the thoughts swirling around your head that that lead young men down on that kind of road. But Tyrion's having them as an adult man, and you get to see like just the toxic masculinity. I know that oh, you're so woke, Tim. Like, no, that's that's really that's what's brewing in his mind. That's how he's having. That's how he can have these thoughts and just look at women with disdain. But it's not him talking; it's his father talking, and him really just really trying to work himself out of a dark place. Yeah, exactly. I, that's exactly how I read it too. Um, the girl took that disappointment too well for his liking. If my lord would prefer a boy, I can have one waiting in his bed. My lord would prefer his wife. My lord would prefer a girl named Taisha. Only if he knows where whores go. It's like... <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to anyone else other than Tyrion. And mm -hmm. he's repeating it like... Uh, compulsively. He's using it as a wedge to like... He's just sort of saying, like, none of you understand me. You don't know what I'm about. Don't think you know what I'm about. I'm going to keep saying this weird thing that I'm obsessed with. Like, mm -hmm. it's very antisocial. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, the girl's mouth tightened. She despises me, he realized, but no more than I despise myself. That he had fucked many a woman who loathed the very sight of him. Tyrion Lannister had no doubt, but the others had at least the grace to feign affection. A little honest loathing might be refreshing, like a tart wine after too much sweet. I believe I have changed my mind, he told her. Wait for me a bed, naked, if you please. I'll be a deal too drunk to fumble at your clothing. Keep your mouth shut and your thighs open, and the two of us should get along splendidly. He gave her a leer, hoping for a taste of fear, but all she gave him was revulsion. No one fears a dwarf. Even Tywin Lannister had not been afraid, though Tyrion had held a crossbow in his hands. Do you moan when you are being fucked? He asked the bed warmer. If it please, my lord. Sorry, I just decided yeah. you could do the voice all of a sudden. Yeah. Apologies. I just, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, just, I don't know. I don't talk this way. It's, um, yeah. yeah. Well, this, this, it ends here. It might please my lord to strangle you. That's how I served my last whore. Do you think your master would object? Surely not. He has a hundred more like you, but no one else like me. This time, when he grinned, he got the fear he wanted. And that's really what he was looking for. He wanted her to fear them. And this is like that moment, like, I wish I was the monster you all claimed me to be. And this is like, Tyrion is going down that road of becoming that monster. And here, he's having his dark thoughts. He's keeping them to himself. Here, now he's letting them spill. But he ha he's not proceeding with action. He's, he's, not, he's not acting on those dark thoughts. Not yet anyway that comes later it's also a bit uh reminds me of cersei where she wants people to fear her as they feared tywin but she can't quite pull it off and she's trying mm -hmm. and this is another example of tywin's dead but his ghost looms large because jamie has same thoughts too when he's doing his travels around the riverlands and he has Thoughts of what would my dad do? And even John Connington has the same thoughts. Like, what would Tywin do in the situation? It's like, even though he's dead and gone, he had he he had such a firm hand on the world of Westeros, such a direct effect on people that that even even dead and gone, his 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 he's everlasting. It, the 
everything that the, the the current the aftermath of everything that he has done we are still going through that i was i always compared tywin and ned in that sense like mm-hmm. ned dies at the end of the book book one and in book five people are still making actions based on his example and how they feel mm-hmm. about him and stuff like that so yeah people these people definitely echo out long after their death with with all the things that they've done yeah and then yeah and it's it's a real world thing echoes of history things that were things that we continue to deal with from events that happened 100 200 300 years ago that are that still just have far reaching effects and so- tywin's whole, at this point in time tywin's been dead for what maybe a few months at most yeah not even yeah mm-hmm. So Illyria was reclining on a padded couch, gobbling hot peppers, gobbling, and and pearl onions from a wooden bowl. His brow was dotted with beads of sweat, his pig's eyes shining above his fat cheeks. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jules danced when he moved his hands. Onyx and opal, tiger's eye and tourmaline, ruby, amethyst, sapphire, emerald, jet and jade, a black diamond and a green pearl. I could live for years on his rings, Tyrion mused, though I'd need a cleaver to claim them. Yeah, and this is, that's what, so for the person in the chat who was talking earlier, like the gemstone, yeah. Yeah, so the rings on Illyrio's hands are all like the, di- they're all the great empire of the dawn. I think dynasties. it's six out of eight, if yeah. my memory serves. It's the majority of the one of them, but like, yeah, Amethyst is there. Uh, Onyx, opal. opal, tourmaline, amethyst, pearl, jade, jade, six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. With and the other two are interesting. Black diamond, like that's diamonds are stars. Mm-hmm. So dark star, black star, dark sun, lion of night. Yeah. And then and a- tiger's eye makes you think of tiger woman. Or the cat eyes of the children of the forest, which that might be the same thing in yeah. some sense. Um, but that's Bloodstone Emperor's wife. So yeah, these are it's quite the collection. Yeah. And of course, like the the obvious black diamond is a black it's a black stone. He has a black stone on his fingers. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> why I think I think this has got to be archetypal symbolism i think i don't think illyrio i mean it could be starry wisdom cult there's two answers okay these gemstones on his hands match the gemstone emperors because illyrio is a starry wisdom cultist and that's intentional or it's a reader clue so that we think of illyrio as a symbolic bloodstone emperor Hmm. right yeah and it's also it's it's also a long a long about a roundabout connection of Valyrians to the great empire of the dawn. And which story do we believe? Do do we believe that Valyrians came to on dragons of their own accord, or were they taught by someone else from the further east? And I tend to go with the Valyrians were taught by that there were other dragon riders before the Valyrians that there are great empire dragon riders. The story of the yellow, of the yellow emperor having a dragon at his court has too many King and yellow parallels. The idea of Euron being thinking he can claim a dragon might be because of what we had talked about in the Ironborn videos of, of ancient Mariner culture. Well, if you have ancient mariners coming from the Far East, then that also could mean blood of the dragon from the Far East. And if Euron even gets an inkling that he might descend from something, then he's like, well, then you're telling me there's a chance, even though I'm not Valyrian, that the Iron Bo- that maybe there's something to Ironborn that could still make make this long shot possible. So yeah, I I I tend to think this is symbolism and and not that Illyrio is Starry Wisdom cult, but that's the thing about Starry Wisdom cult is people don't advertise when they're members. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure Marwyn the Mage and Quaid are Starry Wisdom cult members mm. and wouldn't be surprised if Euron had showed up at a meeting or two. Yeah, uh, But 
Illyrio is mostly engaged in Fagon restoration, which is a very political plot line, not really a magical plot line. So, yeah. And the Church of Starry Wisdom is another one of those things that's it's alluded to, but not really directly pointed at. And I think that probably also has to do with the fact that it's another one of these things that George ripped straight from Lovecraft, like word for word from Lovecraft, the Church of Starry Wisdom. So to to put too much of a lampshade on it would be to invoke, be invoking way more Lovecraft than George's subtle hints and nods. Then it becomes like fully pulling Lovecraft into the story. Yes, and, and in general... um these these king and yellow figures are azor they are they are evil azor high figures almost mm -hmm. always okay again the hound's helmet for lem lem and cloak illyrio's forked beard and and the rotting sea cow thing so during the long night the sun is is described in different ways or sun people azor high is a solar king his transformation during the long night mirrors the darkening of the sun Okay, this is how you need to think about it. So Azor High, when he turns into Night's King, that mimics the bright sun turning into a, a dark sun, a dark star, or just a dark sky. It's it's portrayed different ways. Sometimes that is shown as a sickening of the sun. So in 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 a Renly's tent, one of Renly's guards has sunflowers all over his sigils. Okay. And the green light of the tent makes the sun look sick. And right after that, the shadow baby comes in, kills Renly, the solar king. Okay. And mm -hmm. the candles gutter out and everything goes dark and cold right after we saw a sickened sun symbol. So Illyrio's yellow symbolism being a bloodstone emperor, forked devil beard, rotting sea cow. He is a dirty sun. He is a rotting sick son. That's what he is. And his his second son, his his son, um, is Phagon, who is this rising dragon. And he's he's got a lot of icy symbolism. Like he starts off with his hair dyed blue, for example. Yeah. So. Yeah. And also, if we're connecting it to uh, to more hell symbolism. Um, Illyrio being someone who's been corrupted by vice, uh, sloth, gluttony, and lust seem to be there. But then we remember seven sins. That, remember, we said the seven mushrooms yeah. are all deadly. Yeah, and he is but like we, all seven deadly sins. But then we were, we take into account. Well, Lucifer represents pride. Satan represents wrath. And Azor Ahai as a corrupted, as a like corrupted Christ figure, a corrupted Messiah playing those those would seem to be azor high sins that lead to his downfall pride and wrath which would be the two the two big ones pride being the bit the biggest one because that is the one directly tied to lucifer so then yeah i don't know if it splits out like that but i think illyrio might literally be doing them all so mm -hmm. gluttony obviously pride yes Wrath, I mean, this is a revenge plot. Um, what are the other sins? Envy, sloth. Sloth is easy. Envy, mm -hmm. I mean, he is coveting things in Westeros, higher offices, and he covets Daenerys. Yeah. Gre greed's easy. He's the richest, I mean, he's the richest man in Pentos. Uh, yeah, so greed's there. And then what's the, so wrath? Envy. I'm trying to remember my humunculus from Full Metal. I I know for me it's the movie Seven, but yeah. uh, in any case, yeah, I do. This does seem like a Seven Deadly Sins reference with those Seven Deadly Mushrooms and Illyrio exemplifying all these sins. But mm. so he's got the rings, and I think yeah, I think we've solved it. He's he's a rotting Solar King, and so he's showing us Bloodstone Ember symbolism. So, and yeah, now that they're come sit, my little friend, Illyria waved him closer. The dwarf clambered up onto a chair. It was much too big for him. A cushioned throne attended to accommodate the magister's massive buttocks with thick, sturdy legs to bear his weight. Tyrion Lannister had lived all his life in a world that was too big for him. But in the manse of Illyrio Mopatis, the sense of disproportion assumed grotesque dimensions. So that's more of an Alice in Wonderland thing. Mm hmm. 
Kind of like when she shrinks and everything's yeah. way too big. One pill makes you larger and another makes you small. Exactly. Yeah. Tyrion Lannis. Okay. Um, I am a mouse in a mammoth's lair. He mused. The dormouse. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> the, the what the dormouse says. That's part of the Alice, uh, the song, the White Rabbit song. Let's see. Um, I am a mouse in a mammoth's lair. He said, though at least the mammoth keeps a good cellar. The thought made him thirsty. He called for wine. Did you enjoy the girl I sent you? Illyrio asked. If I had wanted a girl, I would have asked for one. She, if she failed to please. She did all that was required of her. I would hope so. She was trained in lease, where they make an art of love. The king enjoyed her greatly. I kill kings, hadn't you heard? Tyrion smiled evilly over his wine cup. I want no royal leavings. As you wish. Let us eat. Jumbi! Illyrio clapped his hands together and serving men came running. They began with a broth of crab and monkfish and cold egg lime soup as well. Then came quails and honey, a saddle of lamb, goose livers drowned in wine, buttered parsnips, and suckling pig. This is all... All the food is very rich and heavy, and it all sounds like it's just slathered in butter, right? The sight of it all made Tyrion feel queasy, but he forced himself to try a spoon of soup for the sake of politeness, and once he had tasted it, he was lost. The cooks might be old and fat, but they knew their business. He had never eaten so well, even at court. So Illyrio keeps the world's best, the best cooks in Ice and Fire that we've seen so far. <laughs> that's that's not a yeah yeah well, not it makes a... the best cooking coming from old grannies in the kitchen like yeah that 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 of actually course. makes sense yeah of course <laughs> those are the cooks you want as, as he was suckling the meat off the bones of his quail he asked Illyrio about the morning summons the fat man shrugged there are troubles in the east astapor has fallen and marine giscari slave cities that were old when the world was young the suckling pig was carved. Illyrio reached for a piece of the crackling, dipped it in a plum sauce, and ate it with his fingers. Slaver's Bay is a long way from Pentos. Tyrion speared a goose liver on the point of his knife. No man is as cursed as the Kinslayer, he mused, but I could learn to like this hell. This is so, Illyrio agreed, but the world is one great web, and a man dare not touch a single strand lest all the others tremble. All right, so there... Your ice spider symbolism, the world is a spider web. And a vampire. <laughs> More <laughs> wine? Illyrio popped a pepper into his mouth. No, something better. Chumby! He clapped his hands together. <laughs> At the sound, a serving man entered with a covered dish. He placed it in front of Tyrion, and Illyrio leaned across the table to remove the lid. Mushrooms, the magister announced as the smell wafted up, kissed with garlic and bathed in butter. I am told the taste is exquisite. Have one, my friend. Have two. Tyrion had a fat black mushroom halfway to his mouth, but something in Illyrio's voice made him stop abruptly. After you, my lord, he pushed the dish forward uh, toward his host. No, no. Magister Illyrio pushed the mushrooms back. For a heartbeat, it seemed as if a mischievous boy was peering out from inside the cheesemonger's bloated flesh. <laughs> After you, I insist. Cook made them specially for you. Did she indeed? He remembered the cook. The flower on her hands. Heavy breasts shot through with dark blue veins. Ooh, other's language. That was kind of her, but no. Tyrion eased the mushroom back into the lake of butter from which it had emerged. You know, and it dawns on me that we'll see something similar to this later with the honeyed locusts and how his dar is is like really trying to get Danny to eat them. <laughs> Tracy, Tracy <laughs> with the wafer thin. Yes, that's the vibe. <laughs> oh, I insist. It's wafer thin. <laughs> you are too suspicious. Illyrio smiled through his forked yellow beard, oiled every morning to make it gleam like gold, Tyrion suspected. Are you craven? I had not heard that of you. In the Seven Kingdoms, it is considered a grave breach of hospitality to poison your guest at supper. Here as well. Illyrio Mopatis reached for his wine cup. 
Yet when a guest plainly wishes to end his own life, why, his host must oblige him, no. He took a gulp. Magister Ordello was poisoned by a mushroom not half a year ago. The pain is not so much, I am told. Some cramping in the gut, a sudden ache behind the eyes, and it is done. Better a mushroom than a sword through your neck, is it not so? Why die with the taste of blood in your mouth when it could be butter and garlic? The dwarf studied the dish before him. The smell of garlic and butter had his mouth watering. Some part of him wanted those mushrooms, even knowing what they were. <laughs> he was not brave enough to take cold steel to his own belly, but a bite of mushroom would not be so hard. That frightened him more than he could say. You mistake me, he heard himself say. So another thing, that makes it, so Tyrion looking at the mushrooms, eyeing them, wanting them hungrily, knowing they could be poison. You could think of Victarion staring at Dragonbinder the same way of, I know it's going to burn my lungs out, but I really, mm. really, really want to give it a toot. I want to give it a toot. <laughs> Is it so? I wonder. If you would sooner drown in wine, say the word and it shall be done and quickly. Drowning cup by cup wastes time and wine both. You mistake me, Tyrion said again more loudly. <laughs> the buttered mushrooms glistened in the lamplight, dark and inviting. I have no wish to die, I promise you. I have... His voice trailed off uncertainly. <laughs> what do I have? A life to live? Work to do? Children to raise? Lands to rule? A woman to love? You have nothing. Good day, sir. <laughs> Finished Magister Illyrio. <laughs> but we can change that. He, pl we, If we're going to do Alice in Wonderland stuff, might as well slip a little Willy Wonka in there. <laughs> he, he plucked a mushroom from the butter and chewed it lustily. Delicious. The mushrooms are not poisoned. Tyrion was irritated. No. Why should I wish you ill? Uh, so he's trolling. <laughs> yes. Magister Illyrio. Very effective. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting Tyrion, he's forcing Tyrion to confront mm -hmm. what he's actually doing. He's like, you are acting like someone who wants to never be alive again. Mm. And so Tyrion's like, it's he's like, whoa, you're right, I am. And that's what scared him. He's like, there is a part of me that is quitting on life right now. Mm. But by 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 Lirio forcing him to really make this choice to to kill himself or not here it's or to look at it that's what's starting to help pull Tyrion back from the brink so this is actually really good psychological manipulation here it's a little basically like a thought device he's forcing yep. Tyrion to use and that's why Illyrio plays the game yep absolutely we must show a little trust you and I come eat he clapped his hands again we have work to do. My little friend must keep his strength up. The serving men brought out a heron stuffed with figs, veal cutlets blanched with almond milk, creamed heron, candied onions, foul-smelling cheeses, plates of snails, sweetbreads, and a black swan in her plumage. <laughs> Tyrion refused the swan, which reminded him of a supper with his sister. He helped himself to heron and herring, though, and a few of the sweet onions. And the serving men filled his wine cup anew each time he emptied it. You drink a deal of wine for such a little man. Kinslaying is dry work. It gives a man a thirst. The fat man's eyes glittered like the his fingers. There are those in Westeros who would say that killing Lord Lannister was merely a good beginning. So that line right there is just to double down on the gemstone emperor stuff. Because, of course, the gems of the gemstone emperors, they appear in the eyes of the ghosts that Danny sees. So here, the eyes are glittering like the gemstones. That's definitely a confirmation that that is intentional and not just the fact that George only knows 10 gemstones and reuses them all for everything. <laughs> they had best not say it in my sister's hearing or they will find themselves short a tongue. The dwarf tore a loaf of bread in half. And you had best be careful what you say of my family, Magister. Kinslayer or no, I am a lion still. So Tyrion is trying very hard to appear dangerous because he realizes he's in a vulnerable position and he has nothing. So the only thing he has is the fact that he's done this horrible deed of killing his father mm. and that people are potentially afraid of what he'll do. So he's playing that up as much as possible because it's his only weapon mm. essentially. Yeah. And that line of 
a merely a good beginning after killing Tywin. And that's like the line that Aegon, Aegon the Second gives to his brother Aemond after he kills Luke when he calls it a good beginning. It's like, yes, this was the push to cause the chaos to allow this war to begin. And for Illyrio, it's like, yo, you took out me and Varys got the, for, for me and Varys's plan to work. You did us a favor by taking out a major piece. You took a very strong piece off the board. If we look at this like a game of Saivas. And that's kind of why Illyrio is so bemused by Tyrion. Not just that he's useful for their plans, but like, it's mm -hmm. like, dude, hero, man. Thanks so much. We, we know you didn't do this to help us, but pff, mm -hmm. sure made our lives easier. Come yeah. have a drink, you know, have two. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Like when I did the blood and citrus video, the way that different players react to ongoing events is you need to be able to adapt and you need to be able to pivot. And that's something, those are things that Littlefinger can do, those are things that Varys can do, but they are things that Doran Martell has a pretty hard time doing. But it's like here, we cause a little like for Littlefinger, we cause a little chaos for Illyrio, we do a little trolling. But it's like, and sooner or later, think our pieces are going our pieces will scatter every now and then, but eventually they're gonna line back up the way they want them, the way they want the, the way we want them to, if I can speak my words. <laughs> cool. Well, um, and then this is a great little section from Illyrio right here, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, they that seemed to amuse the Lord of Cheese no end. He slapped a meaty thigh and said, "You Westerosi are all the same. You sow some beast upon a scrap of silk, and suddenly you're all lions or dragons or eagles. I can take you to a real lion, my little friend. The prince keeps a pride in his menagerie. Would you like to share a cage with them?" The oh, Lord. The Lords of the Seven Kingdom did make rather much of their sigils, Tyrion had to admit. Yeah, I love that. Very well, he conceded. A Lannister is not a lion. Yet I am still my father's son, and Jamie and Cersei are mine to kill. How odd that you should mention your fair sister, said Illyrio between snails. The queen has offered a lordship to the man who brings her your head, no matter how humble his birth. It was no more than Tyrion had expected. If you mean to take her up on it, make her spread her legs for you as well. The best part of me for the best part of her. That's a fair trade. Oh, shit. <laughs> my head for her. Yep. <laughs> I would sue to have mine own weight in gold. Oh, and even he's like, oh, God, no, I don't want that. The cheesemonger laughed so hard that Tyrion... that's more gold sun symbolism for Illyrio, though. Like, if the yellow cloak wasn't enough, now we're talking about Illyrio's weight in gold. So <laughs> that's why he's fat, by the way. He's round like sun. Go ahead. All the gold in Casterly Rock. Why not? Um, the gold, I grant you, the dwarf said, relieved that he was not about to drown in a gout of half digested eels and sweetmeats. But the rock is mine. Just so. The magister covered his mouth and belched a mighty belch. <laughs> Do you think King Stannis will give it to you? I am told he is a great one for the law. Your brother wears the white cloak, so you are heir by all the laws of Westeros. Stannis might well grant me casterly rock, said Tyrion, but for the small matter of regicide and kinslaying, for those he would shorten me by a head, and I am short enough as I stand. But why would you think I mean to join Lord Stannis? Why else would you go to the wall? Stannis is at the wall. Tyrion rubbed at his nose. What in seven bloody hells is Stannis doing at the wall? Uh, so to comment on that line about Stannis, though, like, yeah, even if you've done something that works in Stannis's favor, he's still going to note a crime for a crime. That's why even though, you know, even though he raises Davos to a lord and gives him all this great blessing and a great opportunity for a future for his sons, he still had to take his fingers for the smuggling. So, yeah, even even though Tyrion, even though uh, Tyrion took out Tywin and he's blamed for Joffrey's murder and all that works to Stannis's advantage, uh, it's not going to make Stannis look the other way on all the crime. Shivering, I would think. It is warmer down in Dorne. Perhaps he should have sailed that way. Tyrion was beginning to suspect that a certain freckled washerwoman knew more of the common tongue than she pretended. 
My niece Marcella is in Dorn, as it happens, and I have half a mind to make her a queen. Illyrio smiled as his serving men spooned out bowls of black cherries and sweet cream for them both. What? All right, so the black cherries and sweet cream, and, and then we can liken that also back to the Dunkin' Egg Tales, the blackberry bushes. These are our these are more of our black fire symbolism stand-ins. What has this poor child done to you that you would wish her dead? Even a kinslayer is not required to slay all his kin, said Tyrion, wounded. Queen her, I said, not kill her. Uh, the queen her is to kill her. That's right. The, this know, is obviously commentary on the Queen Maker chapter. Mm -hmm. Which we got to which you, I know we're, we're going to do. It's going to come. It's going to come on your channel, but we'll get there. We got, I said, the list just keeps growing. <laughs> never ends. It never ends. The cheesemonger spooned up cherries. In Volantis, they use a coin with a crown on one face and a death's head on the other. Yet it is the same coin. To queen her is to kill her. Dawn might rise from a cellar, but Dawn alone is not enough. If you are as clever as our friend insists, you know this. Tyrion looked at the fat man with new interest. He is right on both counts. To queen her is to kill her, and I knew that. Futile gestures are all that remain to me. This one would make my sister weep bitter tears, at least. Yeah. And see, this is another reason why it's good like to pivot from this chapter from the under. Because doing the Dorn and the Blackfire chapters, eventually they, they link up and merge into one another. So it is right. it's great to go from one to the other. Magister Illyrio wipes sweet cream from his mouth with the back of a fat hand. The road to Castle Rock does not go through Dawn, my little friend, nor does it run beneath the wall. Yet there is such a road, I tell you. I am an attainted traitor, a regicide and kinslayer. This talk of roads annoyed him. Does he think this is a game? What one king does, another may undo. In Pentos we have a prince, my friend. He presides at ball and feast and rides about the city in a palaquin of ivory and gold. Three heralds go before him with the golden scales of trade, the iron sword of war, and the silver scourge of justice. On the first day of each new year, he must deflower the maid of the fields and the maid of the seas. Illyrio leaned forward, elbows on the table. Yet should a crop fail, or a war be lost, we cut his throat to appease the gods and choose a new prince, from amongst the 40 families. All right, so 40 families. So in one way, this is both the 40 families of Valyria, the Dragonlord families. And it's also like going back to all the mafia stuff that I've been doing, the five families, like the, like, like the crime families, like who, the question of who really runs the world. And I brought up how before, like the, the Prince of Pentos is a puppet prince, but he's doing all of this symbolic stuff. And yeah, he must deflower the maid of the fields and the maid of the seas. But then if something goes wrong, he becomes like a, a sacrifice, uh, like a, wick, a, a wicker man to appease everything. And I'll, let, I'll turn you loose on this. <laughs> Let's see. Um... Yeah, well, this is a little bit of Green Man folklore as far as you have to a ritualistic uh, copulation at the beginning of the year. So it's it's just a, obviously a kind of fertility ritual mm -hmm. that's going on. Um, I'm not sure why there's a reference to the 40 families. I think that's more of a direct cultural lineage, if anything. Um, but. I mean, it could, I mean, yeah, because Pentos is, is a city that derives its pat that derives its past from, from old Valyria. So having, so themselves having 40 families who truly control everything is, is a hallmark of that. So like an old, like just looking back on the roots of where they came from and yeah. And again, it, and it fits well with the idea of cro of crime families too, really running everything. Yeah, um, I was thinking of the night 40 family sort of the evening. That's what I was thinking of, too. And then the flower, the maid of the fields and the maid of the seas. That's like a, it, it sounds like a rock wife and a salt wife almost. Yeah, it does a little bit. So more of that East, more of that Eastern flair that crops up in, to, into iron board culture. And yeah, yeah there, there could be some merman, merman culture lingering here. It mm -hmm. could be. I could and, have gone um, into it. 
Because if it, it, we've seen that custom exists, you know, in places where the squishers have farmed people. So that could be a very old cultural idea that's left over from that. But yeah, let's keep going. It's all we're three hours in. Yeah. And I'm on little sleep. So okay. Let's so see, um, remind me never to become Prince of Pentos, he says. Oh, your seven kingdoms so different. There is no peace in Westeros, no justice, no faith, and soon enough no food. When men are starving and sick of fear, they look for a savior. They may look, but if all they find is Stannis. Not Stannis, nor Marcella. The yellow smile widened. Another, stronger than Tommen, gentler than Stannis, with a better claim than the girl Marcella. A savior come from across the sea to bind up the wounds of bleeding Westeros. Fine words. Tyrion was unimpressed. Words are wind. Who is this bloody savior? A dragon. The cheesemonger saw the look on his face at that and laughed. A dragon with three heads. So, of course, Illyrio is saying three heads because of the Targaryen sigil, mm -hmm. but the savior is... In the story, it's the three heads of the dragon, which mm -hmm. are three people, one of which is bad. But yeah, yeah. And it's of course, weird. the black fire sigil is just it just being inverted colors. It also is a three headed dragon, so it fits for both. Illyrio being coy on all of this, but also yeah, a savior come from across the sea to bind up the wounds of bleeding Westeros. While he's talking about Fagon, we could say the same of Danny. And if we go back far enough, we could potentially say the same thing about the last hero if he is if he is someone from the east originally. So that about yep. So that that's our chapter. Um, so you can see like where where this is leading, and then it and then it just gets even it gets more heavy handed the more the more he talks because when Tyrion is in that. Uh, litter with Illyrio and there's even less ears to hear them Illyrio will let slip even more but uh you can see like where the, the where the this the seeds of the of the next Blackfire Rebellion have definitely been planted here yep indeed this yep. is how wars are dreamed up uh and from a bean grown from a bean as they say yeah I love I really can't wait to get to the third Tyrion chapter where there's where we meet the crew, man. I love the people on the Shy Maid. I love the Shy Maid chapters. They're some of my favorite. Mm -hmm. I love the intrigue. I love the characters. Griff, Lamore, young Griff, like yeah. Raleigh, <laughs> Half Maester, yeah. it's Yandri and Yasilla, the turtle. Yeah, that's my shit. I love those. But um, there it is. So, so that's the chat. That's Tyrion one, the first of many Tyrion chapters. Uh, Dave, thank you. Thank you for coming on to the stream. This was wonderful. This was a treat. This is a lot better than doing it by myself. It always is more yeah. fun to do it that way. And uh, once again, I will just let everybody know that tomorrow we are doing the little finger stream mm -hmm. with Tim and Nettles. So come on down for that. Yeah. We, we popped that image back up for me. Sure. Uh, just cuz there it's we go pretty, you know, i spent a bunch of time making it last night there it is it's little finger <laughs> he's coming through he's got plans to start wars and stuff and he's doing a lot of embezzlement a lot of it right from the beginning but yeah we'll talk about that so yeah. come on out tomorrow to my channel for that one rlj is coming next week i'm just taking more time on it because i uh i love it very much and i'm I've got a whole bunch of new art and I'm just taking my time with it. So yeah, our one hour of RLJ goodness will be coming out next week, midweek. But yeah, thanks for having me on Tim. I told, I've been oh, begging you to that. take advantage of the, uh, all the favors I owe you. So I'm happy to <laughs> yeah. come here and pay yeah, back a little bit. Cashing in. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yeah, the next stream that I do, it will depend on who, if what guest. I, I've extended a couple of invites. Um, it's just a matter, you know, work working working around people's schedules. So 
uh, depends on who responds, who's who's available, uh, which chapter we're going to do, or if I'm going to solo it again. But uh, you will, everyone will know I try and post these like a day or two in advance. But uh, yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you again, Dave. Uh, everyone come out tomorrow to David Lightbringer's channel for the Littlefinger stream with uh, myself and Girl Nettles will be, will be involved. Uh, subscribe to him on the off chance that you are not already subscribed to him. And uh, yeah, I will see you. Uh, Lies and Citrus is in the works as well as another Wojak video. <laughs> we'll do, we'll cover Sothorios and Ulthos and all the people that, all the places that everyone says I missed. Uh, but yeah, I got, there's a lot in the works just trying to find the time to do it, but, uh, yeah, I will thank you for all the, the PayPal's, the super chats, everyone support the channel, everyone came out and I will see you next time. Good night. Cheers guys.